Welcome to the Mad Ones. I'm your, there's nothing better than a good friend and a patron sending you, you a bottle of your favorite Irish whiskey for St. Patty's Day host, Cam Harless. And with me, as always, is your doesn't get her in-depth analysis and coverage of world events from a failed comedian hostess, Miss Jessica Green. Hi. <laughs> you did so good. Hey, I, that first try. Yeah, yeah. Was not <laughs> exactly anything that happened, and I didn't have to edit out a part of this episode at all. That's exactly what happened. Exactly. <laughs> That's the gospel truth. So, yes. Just so you guys um, know. Wait, do you have something to say? No, I was going to say, you say that I don't get my in-depth analysis of world events from a failed comedian, but um, I definitely get some of it from Yakov Smirnoff, so um, I don't I, know if he counts as failed or not. <laughs> well, I, I, well, I don't know who he is, so... <gasps> For me, oh, yes. Oh dear. Very he was failed. the guy, he was the guy who did the jokes that were like in America this, but in Russia that. Do you remember those jokes? No? Nope, oh god. Not even I'm a really old. Bit. I'm a little you're, old. Yeah, you're That's old. Okay. You are yeah. old. You're very old. Yikes. But for the rest of you, this show is hundred percent bought to brought to you by the fans and patrons. So hit like, subscribe, hit the little bell icon, and share the show with your friends. We've got all sorts of topics we've covered. Death, abortion, pornography, spiritual warfare, exorcism, all kinds of things that might be interesting to your friends. They might they might want to listen to it, so share. That's how we grow. Do that. Also, if you want to directly help us and help this show, you can join our Patreon, uh, which every now and then there's an occasional early episode where you can be in the live stream like right now because this one is pre-recorded. And you you didn't know that until this moment. And I feel bad for you. But if you join Patreon, patreon.com slash the mad ones, uh, we have we also have Zoom hangouts and we'll be grateful. We have and if you want a shirt, if you want to rep us, uh, we are the mad ones.com slash store. You can get a shirt, a tank, a mug. I, look at this mug. Look at this mug. I'm a cartoon on this mug. I look it's like fat Thor on this mug. It's a great mug. Why would you not want that mug? Um, <laughs> but we have a guest. So, of course, we should tell you who it is and bring her on. So joining us tonight is actually is a fascinating person that I found on TikTok. She's a vocalist, a content creator, a free thinker, and a fighter of the current gender narrative. She studies biology and has a very personal experience with transgenderism and gets death threats from transgender activists and NPCs daily. She is a fighter and a truth teller. So please welcome Miss Kat Kattinson to the show. Hello. <laughs> I'm great. I'm so happy to be there. Um Thanks for the fantastic intro, by the way, and um, and both of you also. You're hilarious. Um, I love your chemistry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, I like I said, I saw you on TikTok, and like I'm ninety percent sure the first TikTok that I saw of yours was you responding to a death threat from someone in your comment section. <laughs> oh, okay. Or at least a wish of death of some sort. I feel like that was probably one, at least one of the first three or four that I saw. So um, I figure one of the reasons I found your story interesting is because, like I said, you have a personal experience with the transgender world, with transgender activists, with the whole shebang. And I was wondering, would you be willing to kind of give us a little bit of that story and then we can get into how hateful people are to you? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so... I identified as trans. Um, I, I fluctuated between identifying as a trans man and as um, non-binary. Um, so I'm actually 30 years old and I, I identified as trans um, since like, it was probably around eight or 10 years old was when wow. I really questioned my gender. Um, and I wanted to be a boy and, you know, I, so back then, you know, it's not like it is now where it's like completely public knowledge. And I also grew up in a small town. So um, I didn't actually pursue like medical transition until I was an adult. And um, so around the time I was transitioning was when I was trying to share my social media around my music because I'm also a singer songwriter um, and music producer. So I was kind of sharing like a combination of music content and like my journey as a trans person. But um, so as part of my transition, I started taking testosterone and, you know, to try to make myself appear more male. I'm, I'm, I'm very petite, I'm five foot two and, you know, I'm pretty feminine looking. So it didn't, uh, I don't know if it ever would have 
like fully worked to be honest. Um, Mm -hmm. But I was on testosterone for really not that long, just a few months when I started to have some really severe side effects. Um, And, you know, I had a lot of trans friends online and I had trans friends in real life. I still do, by by the way, like I I like to emphasize that the trans community is not a monolith. Um, And, you know, people can have all different kinds of opinions within that community. So there are still trans people who support me and I appreciate that. But, um, you know, so I had a lot of trans friends online, especially, and most of my followers at the, at that time were the trans community and trans allies. And so there was a big incentive for me to like keep going with my transition. Cause I like, I didn't want to acknowledge that like, wow, I'm starting to feel really bad. I'm starting to have Teddy get down. Sorry. My cat's um, being destructive, <laughs> but you know, I was having these side effects and then the the thing that was really the straw that broke the camel's back for me was that um, my singing voice had been, I knew my voice was going to get deeper and that was something I wanted because I wanted to pass as a man. I wanted to have, you know, more of a manly deep voice. And, but what I didn't realize is that it can, it can ruin your singing voice to take testosterone as a female. Like it's not the same as like a teenage boy going through puberty where they just end up with a deeper voice. Like, Mm -hmm. um, your like vocal structures can't grow after a certain age. So if you're an adult female, like they're already developed. So then when you take testosterone, it just, um, it just destroy it. Well, I won't say destroys, but it affects your vocal anatomy in such a way that like makes it really hard to sing and it makes it hard to sound good. So, you know, I was a Mm semi-professional singer and so that was like heartbreaking for me because I ended up not being able to sing any of my songs anymore. And people were like, well, just lower the key. And because there's like this problem that happens, like I couldn't sing in any key. Um, just like I had to talk in like a really low voice. And if I tried to go any higher, it would just like air and squeaks would come out. So, um, yeah, so it was like I, I literally couldn't sing and it actually was like uncomfortable to speak and sing for a while as well. So that was kind of like my breaking point because singing was such a um, source of stress relief for me and I couldn't do it any. It was painful to do it. And so at that point, I just like I said, you know what, like I have to go off of this um, testosterone. And that kind of started my journey of like detransitioning, like At first, I was still fully involved in the trans ideology. I still wanted to believe in that. And I still fought, you know, my biological sex. I wasn't comfortable. Um, But then I just, I started to do more research. I had some things happen that just kind of made me question, you know, what I had, the ideas coming from the trans community um, or trans activists rather. And so... Yeah, and just one thing led to another, and here I am. And I, I think it's important to, to share my experiences because I think there are probably a lot of people in the community that are like how I was, where, mm-hmm. you know, maybe they're not sure if they're on the right path, but there is so much incentive to just stay on that path that, you know, they could be scared to, um, to step off of it. And once I started talking about detransitioning, like, online, like, because obviously I couldn't just like be online like as a trans man and then just post the next day like as a woman and you know like I had to have some kind of explanation and um, going forward with my music like I needed something to explain why my voice sounds different and why so I felt I, I knew that I had to go public with it for that reason and you know in the beginning I still supported the trans ideology for the most part. And, but just when I even said I'm detransitioning, like that was all that I said, I'm going back to living as a woman. And immediately I got pushed back. Immediately I started getting um, like not death threats at that point, but like people telling me I didn't have a right to have a platform. People telling me that I can't talk about my transition anymore because I was never trans and that like, I'm speaking for the trans community when I shouldn't be speaking for them and so just right away like that put like a pretty bad taste in my mouth because you know like being silenced is like one of the things that like as humans it's it's just it's one of the worst things you can go through because it's like Mm -hmm. you know not only do I disagree with your perspective but like I don't want to hear it at all you don't even have a right to speak and it's just very invalidating well, that's one of those things that I've noticed, especially like, and I think it's there is an important demarcation between like the transgender community versus 
trans activists. That's something I've heard from a lot of people who were either on the left or formerly from the left who've talked about mm -hmm. how, you know, they'll talk to their friends who are trans and they're not for a lot of these major, like dangerously life-changing things that a lot of the trans activists are pushing. And so totally. I, I do think that's a, a, an important line to draw because it's not like Blair White is on board with all of the transgender activists or anything like that. So treating totally. them as a monolith is kind of a silly thing to do. So I appreciate mm -hmm. that demarcation for sure. Um. Well, if Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jessica. No, I, I, I'd like you to um, talk some more. I do have questions. Um, like immediately when you started talking, I wrote down this like slew of questions and I hope I will get to them, but I'd like, I don't want to interrupt you. Please go ahead. Oh, um, actually I'm a fan of Blair White. Um, Blair just had one of, uh, one of my TikToks in a video recently. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know that was going to happen, but it was kind of cool. I was like, whoa. Um, there's me. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you can have trans people who are conservative, you can have trans people who are gender critical. Um, you know, I, like, I do have concerns about doctors recommending transition just because mostly because of the health risks, because they yeah. are, I can talk about that in a bit, but they are severe health risks. Like they aren't, these aren't just small things that can be disregarded. Like, you know, for a trans man or like a, a trans identified female, the risk of heart attack is four times higher. Yeah. And, you know, there's this risk of ovarian cancer, like you're supposed to get surgery within five years if you start testosterone, because, um, you know, it's known to cause cancer. And like, like, these aren't risks that can just be like written off as like, you know, people just say it's safe all the time and like either don't seem aware or just don't seem like informed. But anyway, so you know, I do hesitate to like recommend transition to anybody, but I, you know, I do think that, you know, probably the majority of trans people, especially older trans identified people, like I really do think that they are just trying to be happy. They're just trying to live their best life and they suffer from gender dysphoria, which is like, it is a really difficult me mental illness to yeah. live with. And I did experience gender dysphoria. I still experience it to a degree. Um, Okay. But yeah, so I, I don't judge anybody for transitioning and I understand like the motivation, but you're totally right that these trans activists um, are, are fighting for something completely different. Like they're not just yeah. fighting for like acceptance of trans people or like equal rights, which like, you know, I still fully support that. Like, I don't think that I don't think trans people should be like discriminated against or like treated poorly by the public or anything like that. You know, I think that they're people just like you and me and they deserve respect. But what trans activists are fighting for is not just respect. And in some cases, it's actually taking away from the rights of other groups. And so it's not civil. It's not a civil rights movement anymore when those people are trying to take rights away from somebody else. Like that's not about rights. It's about, I, I say it's about control and conversion, um, what these mm -hmm. activists are asking for. Can I ask you a question about um, kind of what you went through with testosterone? Because Absolutely. I had a friend that I went to college with who went through several different stages of identity changes to put it mm -hmm. mildly. And uh, the last step was for her to transition into a man. And one of the things that she had said to or I, it's really hard for me to properly gender this person because I, I knew, you know, you, you know, someone for like years and years and then they'd say, Hey, call me this. It's like, my brain is not connecting to that. And so it's, there's this weird, I don't know if it's cognitive dissonance that I'm dealing with or what, but, um, she became a he and one of the things that was said several times was the level of aggression was increased. Mm. And through that time, uh, uh, there he had a, a partner beforehand who, who was with him as they were lesbians. And then she, once that happened, she had left him. And it was this very strange situation because she she wanted or he wanted to make her out to be a villain. But I was sitting there and I was like, 
this is a person who got together with you and agreed to be in a relationship with you when you were this way and this person, and you're trying to change your identity so much. And you're also talking about how much more aggressive you are. It's like, I, I, I don't want to crap on you because I've known you for years. You're my friend, but I understand what's going on here from a very, like a personal relational level. I see why this would be a difficult thing to continue. So to, so that's my experience to just throw that out there from a friend. But when you had the testosterone and you were on it, was there a, an increase of aggression of things like that? Was what, what was the emotional impact? There was a huge emotional impact. Um, so I, I think for me, part of it is that like there were deep, deeper issues going on besides the gender dysphoria and the testosterone was somewhat anesthetizing for me. Like it, it was a form of self-harm and self-medication um, mm. so that I could like not deal with some of these deeper issues. So it honestly made me feel kind of euphoric slightly. Okay. And um, it did increase my energy levels a lot um, in terms of the emotion. Um, I don't think I was ever like over the top aggressive, but one thing I did notice is that naturally I'm, I tend to be a big crier. Like I'm, I'm a very um, emotional person. It's, like I cry during movies, um, not as much as like when I was younger, but you know, I am naturally, um, I experience emotions deeply and mm -hmm. that part of me just felt like cut off. And when I would feel emotion, I would feel much more likely to feel anger versus like, like I didn't cry one time when I was on T and I even watched, um, Avengers Endgame <laughs> during that time, <laughs> and I didn't cry at the end. Um, oh wow! When Tony Stark died. Yeah, oh, and I, and I can my feel eyes it. Out. <laughs> <laughs> right, like and like I, you know, I'd been a Marvel fan since like the first Iron Man, so I, he's like one of my favorite characters, and I was like, I really should be crying here, but like literally, I just like watched it, and it was like dry eyes, and it yeah. was just it was weird. Like I felt like this <clears throat> part of me had been cut off emotionally and like as an artist I you know my emotions are fuel for like my art even though I have suffered from depression for some of my life like in a way that's just a part of who I am and I can make arts and that's like a just I don't know like not having that was very weird for me right right um can I ask you um when you're talking about discomfort with your biological sex Mm -hmm. And this being the reason from a very young age where you felt like you wanted to transition into being a male. Um, when you realized that you were having these negative effects from the medication, what were some of the things that you were able to do or are working on doing that made you able to come to terms with your biological sex and become more comfortable with yourself? That's a great question. Um, so it's been like a long process. Like it's been about a year and a half now no more like um well it's been a year and a half since i went off of testosterone um but it's only been about it's actually been less than a year since i actually like came out as like i'm living as a woman again mm -hmm. and stuff um so it was like a long process but um so as a young person i experienced trauma around being a woman um you know like many female humans, I experienced sexual trauma, I experienced like abuse, um, you know, not from anybody like in my family, but it, you know, mm -hmm. I experienced things that made me uncomfortable being a girl. Like I, th I think part of it mm -hmm. is I wanted to be a boy. I mean, part of it is just, you know, I, I was a bit gender non-conforming like naturally, but, um, some of it was, I felt like I would be more protected if I was a boy, like I wouldn't be made fun of as much. Right. Um, I would be safer. And, you know, so I feel like those ideas got instilled in me at like a very young age. Cause like, as, as like a little kid, I was around this other kid, a boy who was really abusive and would like hit me and stuff and like make fun of me for being a girl. And, um, I honestly, I, I couldn't forgive this kid for like a really long time. I like, it was a big deal, but like now I just, I realized that 
you know, he was probably being abused by his parents as well. Sorry not to get all yeah. dark, but no. that I think was right. carried to him and then like carried on to me. And right. so that affected me as, as like an early age. And I just, I wanted to be one of the boys and, you know, so then just going through puberty, like that was hard as well. Cause like, you know, being a female and going through puberty, it's like your body can just like totally change so fast and you can attract yeah. this like unwanted attention that, you know, you go from being seen as a child in society's eyes to being seen as like a sex object in sometimes as little as a year. Like, you know, it was like between like 12 and 13, I like suddenly like developed and it, it was very dramatic for me the way my body changed and the way society reacted to me. So then, um, so moving on to like when I was an adult and I was transitioning, um, I think it was like more subconscious for me at that point, but you know, I, I had these deep fears of all of those things that I had run from by identifying as a man or, mm -hmm. um, and I, I mentioned I identified as non-binary for a while as well, but either way it was trying to move away from womanhood. And so, yeah, when I was experiencing side effects, I mean, and I, I think I knew um, pretty early on that, like the testosterone and medical transition route probably wasn't going to be right for me. Right. But I just, I wanted to believe like so badly that I could be a man and that it would all just work out and I would be fine. And, you know, I had unrealistic expectations. And so it was hard to let go of those unrealistic expectations. And, you know, it was subconscious, but I wasn't ready to uncover that trauma. Like I just, um, yeah. So that was what like kind of kept me going on that path for longer. And it's really been a long process of like meditation, going back to therapy, just have like being forced to come to, in, in a way I'm thankful for the side effects because like I've had to come to terms with just some hard truths about myself and the fact that, you know, whether I want to be a woman or not, like I, I am a woman, like, even if I don't mm -hmm. identify that way, I still have female biology and I can either choose to run from that and be uncomfortable with that, or I can just accept myself. And, you know, part of who I am is my biological sex. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah, that's like kind of my process in a nutshell. I know that was kind of long, so. <laughs> no, no, you're no. Good. <laughs> that, that part is so important. And I really do think deserves a background explanation because uh, gender dysphoria is not really understood. Um, it's an anathema in our society today to say that it is a mental illness and that people who have it are in fact suffering. And there's a mm -hmm. piece of empathy that gets lost there because you do have um, trans activism coming up against people and then them reacting sort of negatively toward it, that there is this aspect of humanity and empathy gets lost in the mix that, hey, there are people who are suffering and we need to actually like address that yeah. before we Absolutely. address the culture war. Well, yeah. And I think one of the things that I've I've noticed a lot in my reading about detransitioning and transgender, uh, I'll say ideology rather than studies, because a lot of times it's, it's based in ideology rather than in yeah. mm. science a lot of times. Um, so uh, one of the things that I, you know, that there's the common um, statistic that like 40% of people who are transgender and who don't transition commit suicide. And mm -hmm. that's a horrifying figure. Um, but one of the things that I, I was reading when I was reading probably a couple of years ago on this was that like when they, when psychologists, I guess, or I don't know if it was psychiatrists or what, looked back on some of these suicides and some of the issues and some of the, what had happened to these specific people, they found that there were several, um, between one to two um, undiagnosed comorbidities. And so it's, it was, what I'd read was that what had essentially happened with the focus on the trans aspect or the gender dysphoria part of their their mental health, they had essentially missed or swept under the rug things like bipolar or major depressive disorder and said, oh, it's just gender dys dysphoria. If you do the, if you take the, the T or come out as transgender, then you'll have, you'll be healed. This will, this will be your cure. And so these people 
did not have a cure because they're they're true like the underlying some underlying issues weren't addressed um and i've also heard that one of the stats that's not reported is that <clears throat> for a lot of people who transition there is a especially medically transit like uh surgically transition i don't know if there's a better word for that um but that there is a period of euphoria after that happens but then mm -hmm. that starts to fade away and if they have these comorbidities that actual number of suicides goes back up and even surpasses yes. 40 is that is my wrong <laughs> No, you're absolutely right. Um, so if you look at the body of research um, on medical transit, so medical transition is basically hormones, yeah. um, top surgery, bottom surgery. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's a slight distinction, you know, surgical obviously is like strictly just yeah. the surgeries. But mm -hmm. um, so when you look at the research in terms of, you know, how effective these procedures are at improving mental health, the ones that are the best designed, like with the most participants and like the best study design and the longest term, the trend is that the best the best studies show the worst outcomes. Mm -hmm. And um, all of the studies with like a moderate to high risk of bias. Um, and one of the ways that that there's a risk of bias is that, you know, they'll have a study with, let's say, 200 people and like 120 of them will drop out. Um mm -hmm. So they don't know what happens to these people. They just stop reporting back. And, you know, that's over 50% of the people in a lot of these studies. Or they have a small sample size. Or they're, like, comparing two groups that aren't equivalent at all. Like, there's there's one that came out. I think it was in 2020 or 2021. But I'm pretty sure it's the most recent study on trans healthcare. Don't quote me on. Like, there could be one from this year that I, that I don't know about yet. But I, I try to keep up with that stuff um, pretty well. And people have you know, when I'm posting on TikTok, they always post this one as like, oh, um, well, here's some proof that it is effective because it has a, like a large sample size. But when you look at the comparison groups, it's comparing people who are like older with like better jobs and like transitioned at a later age. And then they're comparing that with like young people, like the surgical group was just better off in general, like they were wealthier and older. Mm -hmm. And then like the non-surgical group was younger um you know they were more unstable just you know there was various things that made the groups completely not comparable at all so yeah um i think i might have gone off topic like slightly but no, yeah the okay. trans okay <laughs> yeah the trans research is um it's really really lacking and on my tiktok i've posted a bunch of like meta analyses and um reviews done by experts that have pointed out these problems with the body of research. Um, but then you have these like crazy propaganda sites um, that just, you know, they make it sound like the evidence is really, really strong yeah. and that, you know, we're recommending this method because it's scientifically supported and to not recommend it is like unethical because this is obviously the best treatment, but really we haven't tested any other treatments and yeah. okay. there's never been anything like clinical trials on, you know, cross sex hormones to treat gender dysphoria. There's never been clinical trials on any of this. And I just, um, and that was one of the things that really piqued me and made me, um, you know, start to question all of it is like, it's just, it's not being approached like all other fields of medicine are being approached. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and so as someone who has studied science and, you know, like taking biochemistry and learning about drugs that have, even after going through clinical trials, after being approved by the FDA, they, you know, later get taken off the market and just um, like all of these safeguards that they're supposed to go through to, um, to say this is a safe treatment for the general public, it's like somehow the trans situation, it, these drugs and surgeries just got fast tracked into Lobbying being acceptable. Yeah, absolutely. And then now you have like these just experimental surgeries. It's like there's these doctors that are inventing like signature surgeries, like um, not to get too graphic, but like gender nullification surgery is like a new one. Like a Kindle? Um, Pretty, yes, like it's literally okay. supposed to just get rid of everything, like flatten a person out. And there have never been studies on something like this. Um, yet the doctors are just going ahead and experimenting on healthy bodies 
um, to treat someone with a mental illness. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's unethical. It's not supported by science. So um, it's just sad that so much misinformation is being spread. And so that is one of my goals is just to like challenge it and just, you know, I don't have a PhD, but I, I've taken enough biology to like just see some of the inconsistencies and some of the problems with um, this approach. So I, I want to ask you while we're on the topic of doctors, because a mm -hmm. lot of focus kind of gets put on um, like sort of the cultural aspects of uh, transgender and transitioning, transitioning, excuse me. But what I want to talk about is um, the therapy that you're able to receive both when you are dysphoric and you want to seek gender transition. And then also when you decide maybe this isn't the right path for me, um, were you a self-affirming transgender person or is that something that you had diagnosed by a doctor? And then once you started to make this transition, uh, what was available to you in terms of like therapy? And did at any point someone try to address your depression rather than pushing you into um, gender transition? So um, I had kind of all of that. <laughs> like I, okay. I had two separate experiences. So um, when I was a teenager and I first came out to my parents as transgender, um, so this was in like the late 2000s. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I was like 16, 17. Um, they did, my parents did take me to a gender therapist and this was somebody who, um, I won't name names, but they, at the time, I think they still are, um, but they are like a major influence in the gender care community in Sacramento. Um, they're like, you know, basically the head honcho of like gender care in Sacramento. And so they took me to this person thinking that they were going to be good. And um, basically after two appointments, um, well, on the first appointment, he affirmed me, you know, as a trans man and started calling me he, him and all of that on the first appointments, you know. Her and I, first appointment. Wow. First appointment, yeah. Hard <laughs> interrupt. I'm just reeling. Oh, like, no, like thirty sorry. minutes in. Wow. And this is uh, <laughs> and this is common practice as well. This is what I hear from people who are taking their kids to gender therapists. And it, when you look at the studies on detransitioners as well, um, I you know I, the majority of them are saying they're not being properly evaluated by doctors um, or therapists. So anyway, that was my experience. I was 17. And um, then what I think within like two or three appointments was when he brought up the testosterone. And so I had had a background as I had struggled with an eating disorder, um, which I was open about that. You know, I had some comorbid conditions. Um, later on, I also got a personality disorder diagnosis as well. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I think I got my um, borderline personality disorder and ADHD um, or mm -hmm. at the time it was ADD. Now ADD is not a thing anymore. It's like ADHD, but I got those a little bit later, but you know, I did have some, my point is I had some comorbid conditions going on and like my eating disorder was something that was in my charts. Like that was something I openly talked about and that just didn't seem to concern him at all. And you know, his, mm -hmm. his view on it was that the eating disorder was more a symptom of, uh, of the gender dysphoria rather than the other way around but really it's like when you're looking at a person it's like everything's intertwined right you can't just yeah. like it's like a bunch of necklaces like tangled up so much that you can't really pull them apart like it's you know it's it's just mental health or, or mental illness manifesting in the way that it manifests um right. so so yeah that was when i was 17 and so he started pushing for the testosterone like pretty early but thank god i I was afraid to start it at that age because I didn't feel that I had enough family support. Um, like I said, I was in a small town and I had to drive to Sacramento to see this person. And mm -hmm. I didn't feel like there were enough people in my community that supported me. Like my parents didn't fully, like they loved me and like, like they did support me, but they didn't support this. Um, like they didn't support my transition. And I used to like hate them for that and think it was like the worst thing, but <laughs> Now I, I totally see where they were coming from, but, and then I was afraid of losing my singing voice too, because that mm -hmm. was such a big part of what I like to do and what I wanted to do like as a job and, or as a career. 
So I didn't end up starting the testosterone. And then when I went to university a couple years later, I, I pretty much went back in the closet for like a few years because I just, you know, I moved away from my hometown. I moved to Santa Cruz and I was like at UC Santa Cruz and I, they were like definitely more accepting of transgender than like people in my town were, but still it's just like, it's terrifying to like, it's already terrifying to like go off to college. Right. But like when you're going off, like as a new name and like, as like a new person and you don't pass it all, like you're trying to tell people like, yeah, my pronouns are, I was trying to tell people my pronouns are he, him. Um, but I, you don't pass it all. And it's just, it was too much. And so I just kind of like, didn't tell anyone I was trans and just kind of, um, kept, you know, was living as a girl. And so then when I, um, I ended up dropping out of UC Santa Cruz because of mental health issues and coming back to my hometown. And, um, so when I came out and like actually transitioned, like as an adult, that was after the university experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and so at that point I just, um, so I found out that Planned Parenthood did uh, gender transitions because there weren't any gender clinics like in my immediate vicinity. And it was, um, right. so it was during COVID at this yeah. point. And so I was like, well, I'll try calling Planned Parenthood. And so this was how it worked. It was within the course of a couple of days. I called, I left a message. Um, actually, I can't remember if um, I left a message or if just like, uh, the receptionist like picked it up and talked to me, but either way, I just said like, I'd like to talk to a doctor about like starting hormones. And like, I thought it was gonna be like a process, right? Like I thought I would at least have to have like therapist approval or something. Right. But then, right, just, I thought there'd be some kind of evaluation. So I, you know, I was thinking like, this might take like weeks or months. Like, I just wanna get the ball rolling and, you know, find out about this, right? So then I get a call back from, the doctor who I can't say I'm a hundred percent certain, but I believe um, was a trans woman. Okay. And, you know, so, so I'm not saying to like judge, but it's just like when you have a doctor who like obviously has transitioned themselves and is pro transition, like, you know, I'm not going to say that that has no effect on like how they respond mm -hmm. to patients. But anyway, so the doctor called me back we talked for about 30 minutes and I got my testosterone prescription over the phone. Holy cow. So yeah. And, and that's, what's wild to me is this would be one thing. If this ideology, if this idea, if this treatment were confined to consenting adults who have fully grown brains that can think through everything, but I get on Twitter and I see a birth certificate change for a four-year-old going from male to female. And I see, you know, that there's a show on, I don't, I want to say it's TLC or something. I'm not sure about a, I am jazz. Yeah. And with that, so there are a lot of children who, I don't want to besmirch the minds of children. They're beautiful, wonderful things who can take in all sorts of knowledge and they are able to, they're able to think, but you have to be taught to reason. You have to be taught to think logically, to think critically. You have to have certain tools in your tool belt before you make decisions. You have to have mm -hmm. wisdom and children do not have wisdom. If they did, I wouldn't have to deal with any of my children at any point during the day. They'd be fine, you know, but I can't get them to stop acting like dogs and biting each other. Like, I mean, it's just, it's just, that's what children do. Um, and yeah. so the idea, and I've heard it even so, so low as an 18 month old who parents say is definitely the opposite gender and that they will start cross gender hormones as soon as they can that's just and unbelievable that horrifying i mean it's me. not unbelievable sadly i'm not i'm not actually in disbelief <laughs> at this point but it is sad it's absolutely crazy and ridiculous 
and, and I don't know if you, you may know this. I don't watch I Am Jazz, or and I haven't spent much time thinking about jazz. But one of the things that I had heard was that jazz was put on, uh, I guess, what are they? Puberty blockers. Yeah, yeah, puberty blockers and uh, cross cross, cross sex, sex hormones. hormones. And that by the time she got to the point where she wanted to surgically transition, she couldn't because there wasn't enough growth in her sexual organs mm -hmm. to actually make that a viable um, option. Is that is that a thing? <laughs> Um, well, yeah, so, um, so yeah, one of the risks with puberty blockers, um, I'm just going to be blunt and say that go for it based on the evidence I've come across, I, I don't believe that trans surgery is an appropriate treatment for anyone, you know, e like even an adult, yeah. I, there are so many risks and I've seen so many people online just in pain that never goes away. Yeah. Um, having, I, I think the complications rate is extremely understated because like if you go on YouTube and you actually watch the stories of people who are posting about their, you know, their, um, genital surgery and stuff, yeah. just the side effects they talk about and the complications are just absolutely dreadful. Um, They're one horrifying. of my favorite, like, yeah, I, I've been and, on they, the and it never D goes away. Yeah. And I've, I've, sorry, I've been ahead. on the D-Trans subreddit. And there are some facts about what especially male to female surgery does that like if I had that happening in my body, I wouldn't want to live. Right. Like, I mean, it's, like, it's the most sensitive area of a person's body. Right. And they're doing this like extremely invasive procedure that like is honestly it's experiment. It's still experimental surgery. Like there's never been. um you know, there, there, I mean, I don't even know how you would test um, success because we don't have any control groups, right? Like we don't have, we don't know that it's any more effective than a placebo. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you go to psychology, I'm getting a little off track here, I know, but mm -hmm. psychology research shows that um, when people believe that something benefits them, uh, they're more likely to hold that belief if, if they believe that it's beneficial to them. And then also we know that people who go through like hazing uh, rituals and things like that, they are more likely to feel loyalty to the group they belong to. So, you know, it's like when you see these people on probably, I haven't spent a lot of time on Dtrend subreddit, but definitely like on YouTube, these people posting about their complications and stuff. It's always like they list off like, honestly, some of the worst health effects you could like ever imagine, you know? I mean, yeah. it's literally... I mean, let's just say what it is like it's body mutilation and it's extremely painful and they list off how much pain they're in. Like they have to have like a catheter in for like months or years. Some of them are have a coloscopy bag um, yeah. from these surgeries. And yet most of them are still saying like, oh, but it was worth it. But, you know, I'm happy now and um, I'm affirmed in my gender. And it's just like, of course, they're going to say that, like, even if they don't. You know, even if, um, well, it's just given that psychology that I just talked about, it's, it's, it's like, they're going to say that it helped them because they have yeah. incentive to say that. And, but in a person like Jazz's situation, um, so yes, puberty blockers completely arrest the development of the gonads and the sex organs. So, um, so yeah, they don't have enough material to work with if a person is to go do the surgery and, um, Jazz did have surgery, but has already had, I think, four different corrective procedures. And just even what they showed on the show, I mean, it was horrifying. And this is, yeah. you know, a public, um, publicly available, like, TV show. So I can't even imagine what was cut out and what wasn't shown on camera. So yeah. it's just, it's it's very disturbing. Well, and it's, it, you know, there is incentive for placebo, but there's also the reverse of that, which is kind of sunken cost, which is I've done this thing. How fearful must someone be to think I've done the wrong thing? Because if they've done the wrong thing, if they've actually hurted themselves, mutilated themselves, yeah. et cetera, like what does that do to you psychologically? And so there's there's a lot of positive and negative incentive to just keep 
the the line to keep mm-hmm. the story and stick to it. I mean, it's ah, it, it's terrifying to me. And as it doesn't a father, help that it doesn't help that when you talk about the effects, like if you literally just want to protect other people and you come forward and you know talk about, well, maybe this wasn't right for me. You will get attacked. You will get vilified um because nobody wants to hear everyone wants to believe in like this fantasy and so you know just that uh is 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 part of that as well it's you know it's terrifying to think that your whole community is going to turn on you Mm -hmm. um if you decide to detransition or if you decide that you made the wrong decision and and like want to go back on it well, and, and, and you, you, we talk, we're, we're having to use euphemism a lot when we're talking about these effects because I can't, I feel like I've talked about it somewhat before on an episode, um, but I can't, the reason it's hard to say isn't just because like, oh, I'm worried about censors. It's mm-hmm. because s- describing verbally some of the stories that I've read, some of the different things I've seen, it hurts to say because it's just so viscerally unnerving, like like missed follicles that have been implanted inside of one's body for one, like men who have now have a vagina mm-hmm. having hair growing out of it. Right. Yes. I've heard of, like, of that as well. Wh- like yeah. that's, that's disturbing to even think about. You know, like I, the, the different, like if you're very, if you're, if people who are listening or watching are actually interested in knowing you're going to have to look it up. Cause that's all I'll give you because it's like, it's disturbing. Yeah. I talk, um, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I said, I want to talk for a minute about some of the um, cultural pushback you received after you decided it, it, it's very, um, titanically brave to go against your community and your in-group. I've had this personally experience through political side. Um, I cannot imagine, given the interactions that I've had with trans rights activists on the internet, um, just being like a cisgendered person, um, I cannot imagine being an insider to that community and being an apostate to that community. They don't want you to exist. They don't want you to exist. Um, I I have experienced that with the atheist community. I've experienced that with the politically left community. I have a exper- I have a modicum of the experience that I am sure you, that you have received. Can you tell us a little bit about what you think drives that, and um, what also some you examples know, would be would be yeah good some as examples well. and like what do you think drives that, and then what do you think the outcome of this will be? Sure. Um, so one of the first people I told that I was detransitioning was a friend in real life who is trans. And, um, you know, I, I still deeply care for this person and, you know, I, I hope they're doing okay, but, um, they were definitely somebody that encouraged me to go forward with my transition. Like, even like when I said I was having doubts, like, um, they were just like, well, you know, once I got on, once I started seeing changes from estrogen, once I like scheduled my top surgery, like, like all of that, like, I just, I felt so much better and like, and and you will too. And so like, I think that they thought they were doing the right thing, but like, they definitely did encourage me to transition. And so then when I started talking about the side effects and how I was like worried about my voice and I just really opened up to this person and their response was like, so you're detransitioning? And just the way they said it was like, they were looking at me like I was contagious or something. <laughs> like, um, like wow, you know, a detransitioner in the flesh, like this doesn't happen. Like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna hear that from you. And, but for a while I was identifying as non-binary. And so I was like, well, I, I think I'm just non-binary. And, you know, so I'm not like detransitioning as in like, I still believe in all this stuff. Um, so don't worry. Uh, but yeah, just like saying that and having, you know, this person kind of judge me for detransitioning, or or at least it felt that way was kind of the first thing. And 
so then, uh, so the next thing I noticed was when I posted like my first detransition video, which was, um, I was singing along to that Kesha song, Woman, and it was just like, you know, at, on this date, I, I came out as a trans man. On this date, I came out as non-binary. And today I'm coming out as a woman uh, is, is basically all it was. And it was just like a cute little like dancing video. Yeah. And, you know, probably half of the response was like positive and, and supportive. But I just noticed this like trend of like comments that were like, okay, but you better not become a turf. You better not talk about these things. Um, you know, watch what you say. Um, or, and people saying like, well, you are never really trans. Um, mm -hmm. Or like telling other people in my comment section, like just keep in mind, like this girl was never really trans because she's detransitioning. And like, you know, once you detransition, that means like, you know, even though, as I said, like I literally identified as something other than female for like 20 years of my life. Um, and but that and is experienced a, uh, gender dysphoria, the pain and trauma of gender dysphoria. I absolutely experienced right. dysphoria, experienced like somewhat of medical transition, like apparently just because you decide it's not for you, you know, and, and like my initially, like I still fully believed like the trans ideology. I still fully believed in it. I just couldn't keep going because of the side effects and because of my voice, you know? Right. And for people to just say like, well, none of that's valid at all. I hate the word valid now, honestly. Yeah. Like it's just, <laughs> Can it's understand just so that. overused. It's just been- How about the word just, problematic? Everything's valid. <laughs> problematic, yes. <laughs> valid is problematic. Um, <laughs> problematically valid, valid, validly problematic. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, so just, yeah, all of that that you went through doesn't count. Um, and like yeah. the other thing is it's like, you know, even doctors like affirmed that I was trans, right? And like yeah. like therapists, doctors, like they all thought I was legit, but somehow like now none of that matters because now I've detransitioned. So just doesn't count and I just need to shut up about it. And so that made me like pretty angry. Um <laughs> And sure. I wasn't like, I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't like openly angry, like, well, I'm going to post, like, I'm going to go after these people online or something. But I did kind of stand up for myself and just say, no, like, um, one thing they were saying to me was like, I shouldn't use the word detransition because it's like a dirty word that like the right is like co-opting for their agenda or, or whatever. And right. um, I kind of, um, I kind of want to talk like at least for a little bit at some point about kind of my like political awakening sure. as well. Sure, um, yeah, yeah. But just for now, um, let me just finish what I'm saying about like the yeah. the trans TikTokers and stuff. So, um, you know, they were just telling me that I couldn't say words like detransition. Um, another thing I had said is that I had health issues from the testosterone or that I, I, I had um, physical damage from the testosterone, which was true. Like I had... I was having heart palpitations and um, I'm not really sure at this point if it was a, a liver thing or like a gallbladder thing, but mm -hmm. I was having like this severe pain on my right side. Um, at some points it was like hard to move. Like I just had this like pain and pressure. I had like nausea going on and just like all these health effects going on. And like, you know, so I mentioned that and people said never to call it damage. Like, you know, you have to just be like, like sugarcoat everything and be positive all the time. Um, because if you don't, then you're like harming the trans community. And then, so it was a, it was a long process, but just getting the, those type of reactions, I just started to honestly question everything. I'm like, this just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that people who, that like rational people would be telling me to shut up because it's like, they should be wanting me they should be wanting to hear detransitioners, honestly, because they should be like wanting to protect people for, for making the wrong choice. And instead it's like their attitude is like, we don't give, we don't care about detransitioners um, because you know, the, it's because they're so rare, like the net benefit on the trans community is more important than like anyone right. who gets caught in the crossfire, even kids, you know, even like yeah. kids that are sterilizing themselves, like they don't matter as long as like whatever they say it is like, 97 to 90 percent to 99 percent of people don't detransition which is like a completely bogus statistic anyway 
So, yeah. and the, the part that really trips me out about that is because the entire claim of the trans ideology is that you um, deserve to be authentically who you are in your identity. And so if who you are authentically in your identity is not transgender and you discover that in the process, well, then you have to pretend you don't exist. And you have yeah. to pretend that what's happening to you, the health effects that you're going through aren't happening. You have to sugarcoat everything. So it seems right. to me that it has nothing to do with living as your authentic identity. It has everything to do with affirming the people who've decided that they're transgender and they want that affirmed at the cost of anyone and anything. Yeah. It's ideological possession. Is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, um, I, I have a lot of push. I, I push back a lot on people who just say that I'm cis. I don't. So I don't use the word cisgender anymore. Like, I don't I don't believe in that concept because mm -hmm. I don't I don't identify as a woman. Like, I, I just believe that I, I am a woman because that's the body I was born into. Right. And there's no I don't think that, like, consciousness has a gender you know, like I am just a body and like I'm my consciousness and I exist in the body that I have, but like I don't wake up and feel like, oh yeah, I have this magical girly feeling inside me right. or right. anything. <laughs> and, um, you know, like like if anyone wants to think of themselves as cisgender, like that's fine. But I, I, I think the enforcement of that label on like the rest of the population. I don't like it. <laughs> well, I don't, this is, never this have. Is this is something that um, actually kind of affects me personally, because I, I was around 16 in the year 2000. As I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, I'm old. So mm -hmm. um, when I was growing up and when I was a teenager, I was a distinctly non-feminine uh, girl. I was raised by a single father. There was no female influence in my life. I was 25 years old before I ever used a curling iron, and I made a big mess <laughs> of that. I, I don't wear makeup. I don't wear dresses. I don't wear high heels. Nothing about what uh, tra trans women seem to identify as female is part of my life. And yet I am a woman. And so for me, I feel like had I been born 10 or 20 years later than when I was born, the nascent identity that I had not yet developed as a non-feminine woman would have been co-opted into this transgender movement. And I would not have been allowed to develop into the person who I was actually going to become later on in my life now that I'm almost 40 years old. I'm not a feminine woman, but I am a woman. And that's, I mean, I that's would say you're feminine. Well, I th I, thank you. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, well, and that's when I, that's... When I see trans women um, depicting themselves as women, I don't recognize those qualities in myself. It seems a very yeah. pornified version of women. It's lipstick, it's makeup, it's hair, it's, it's dresses. These are all things that aren't part of my life and I am a woman and this that, that right. to me concerns me for girls coming up now who are like me girls like me aren't allowed to exist anymore we have to be trans you know we have to be uh, uh and this is something that JK Rowling to bring her up and I'm sorry I know I interrupted you Cam I'm sorry but JK Rowling brought this up in the open letter that she penned about how girls who are already having trouble with their identities in this world because, and I believe that it is a strain of misogyny that does not accept young women um, that makes them feel like they would be more comfortable as males because femininity, because being a young girl is not acceptable in our society. It's something looked down on. And then because you don't want to be something that is looked down on, easy to victimize, as you pointed out, you feel you would be better off as a man. And I was totally. wondering, does this, I, do you feel uh, you identify with this? Because this has been my thinking and identifying with my own case, where I'm like, man, had I been born 20 years later, I wouldn't have been allowed to develop. I wouldn't have been allowed to become who I am. And it Ab I, absolutely it angers me, to be honest. Yeah, I, I totally see and, and feel where you're coming from. And um, so the this whole idea of like, of like the gender spectrum and, you know, the gender, I don't know that I agree with this whole separation of the, you know, the meanings of the word sex and gender, like, 
you know, but I, I refer to gender that way because so I can be understood because that's how, you know, this community understands the word gender now. But so you have this like so-called gender spectrum, right? And um, on one side is, you know, the very masculine and on one side is like the very feminine. And like a lot of the times the things that they're considering masculine and feminine are like very shallow, like yeah. aesthetic things, you know, yeah. <laughs> like it's like um, it's like lipstick over here and like plaid shirts over here (laughs) (laughs) right um and it's like um and it's like rather than because like I my mom defined femininity in like a really in in a way that I do approve of which is is just like like as a woman anything you do is feminine because because you're a woman and that's just you know women are feminine and men are masculine so if you're a woman and you're fixing your car or your um uh, you're building a house or whatever, that is a feminine thing to do because, you know, you are a woman and a woman can do anything. It's it's just feminine because you're a woman. But this idea of femininity um, in the gender spectrum, like it's 100% based on misogyny. It's 100% based on reductive gender stereotypes. Um, so yeah, like the fact that, I mean... <laughs> Like I posted a TikTok the other day where I was wearing no makeup and a and a J.K. Rowling T-shirt uh, to bring up J.K. Rowling, but people were commenting that I looked like a they them or, or they couldn't tell if I was male or female, um, which is just I mean come on that's just ridiculous. But yeah, it's like these kids like are literally being taught that female means like eyeshadow and lipstick and uh, and like, you know, I enjoy wearing makeup sometimes. Sometimes I enjoy wearing dresses, but it's like now that I know that's not what makes me a woman and I just right. like those things because I like those things. Like it's not, uh, it's not because I'm like born with this like innate desire to be like dolled up and like wearing dresses. It's like a personal choice that has nothing to, right. it has no bearing on my womanhood. So like, yeah, now I'm like, occasionally I enjoy makeup, but when you're literally told like, that is like a solid part of your identity. Like as if I were to like, you know, take my eyeshadow off, like I'd suddenly be like non-binary. Right. <laughs> like, or or, it's just or in insane. the case of in the case of men who put on eyeshadow, in the case of men who put on dresses, in the case of men who put on high heels, and then feel that they're entitled to be in women's spaces because they have adopted these very shallow uh outward displays of womanhood that really kind of come from like a I, 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 you know, I really think like porn has a lot to do with it. Like it's a porn version of women that seems to be like put on like a costume and then grants men access to women's spaces that, you know what, the, the eyeshadow and the lipstick don't in fact make you a woman. It doesn't yeah. entitle you to come into my area. And, you know, I, I this is, you know, I, a whole other area that we can break into, but I feel Although it, the, it's nothing is being written into laws that are saying that women are being pushed out of society, the net effect of allowing men into what are otherwise female safe spaces is that women no longer feel safe in those spaces. And then women are being pushed out of public space. And so we're talking yes. about like gyms and spas and all of these things. And I'm I'm not saying that like, okay, Blair White, for example, looks very much like a woman. I wouldn't want her to go into a men's room and possibly be harmed. But there needs to be some kind of um, acknowledgement made that when men who may not be gender dysphoric, but may in fact have sexual kinks, are adopting these qualities to be given access to women's spaces, this is not an uncommon thing that's happening. And the net effect is that women are being pushed out of public society. And I, when I say this, I get called a TERF, the trans exclusive (laughs) radical feminist. There is nothing radical feminist about me. I'm a housewife. I'm an Orthodox Christian. I cover my hair when I go to church. Like I'm not a radical feminist. I'm the opposite of that. I, but I, I do feel unprotected um, in light of wanting to give a very small part of society run over my safe spaces. 
And I was wondering if you had anything to add about um, that topic. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a huge topic. Um, I, I don't identify as a feminist either. Um, and like, the thing is, is it's just become this disparaging term for a woman. Um, a lot of people say it as a slur because it's yeah. pretty much only used on women and they don't even know what you believe. They don't care what you believe. They just know that you're challenging their ideology and they want something right. to call you. I, I see the word cis being used as a slur as well. Um, and so anyway, so yes, it's, it's totally the safe spaces thing. Um, women's prisons is another huge concern. Like honestly, out of all the women's spaces, it's probably like the worst because you literally have male sex offenders sleeping in the same cells as, you know, female criminals, um, yep. who are Great. mostly non who are mostly non-violent criminals as well. I mean, it wouldn't be okay even if they were violent criminals, but I'm just saying there's a completely level, a different level for someone who's in there for violence, um, specifically sexual violence that is being put in the same cells as like these female inmates. And mm -hmm. this is documented to be happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just, it's unacceptable. But another thing is like just the erasure of the word woman and how like, you know, the Biden administration in um, a budget that we released, I, I don't remember if it was earlier this year or last year, but it now refers to mothers as birthing people. Yeah. And um, we have all these medical articles about periods and stuff like that now referred to like menstruators, da da da. Chest and feeders. Ch oh God, that one is just so dystopian. It's like so, <laughs> It's like it's humanizing. So Absolutely. And you know, the, what female genitalia being referred to as a front hole um <sighs> and the fact oh that my God. the fact that they even want to try to pass off like a man who has had surgery they want to call that a vagina like it is not the same organ yeah. it i mean yeah it's, it's not the same thing at all and it's just it is an insult to women and you don't people say well we're just being inclusive and you're just a turf because you don't want to like women. use inclusive language and yeah exactly it's not inclusive as of women at all like you know these this is a fraction of the po a small fraction of 1% of the population right. and you know most women who have babies are fully happy to be called mother like you know mother is a very respectful term with like a lot of meaning to it versus like birthing person or birther it just sounds like something out in 1984 it sounds terrible and we shouldn't be sacrificing the needs of literally half the population for half of one percent of the population it just doesn't make sense i do have my mother in my phone as my birthing person and she <laughs> hates it I she understand hates why. it um <laughs> but when you said the word or the i guess part of a word cis as in cisgender yes. since the first time i heard this this word i've hated it because in my opinion it sounds a lot like someone is trying to force an identity onto me when yes. i have been happy my entire life to for a good while to be a boy and for now to be a man i do not like this idea that i have to qualify my own existence and identity to make half of one percent or one percent of the population happy like it it bugs me that someone was like oh are you cisgender and i'm like no i'm a dude <laughs> you know like why do i have to say that i shouldn't have to. And, and, and when when i first heard it it reminded me a lot of kind of the transition in my mind when i was you know a younger teen to older teen because up until a certain point i didn't know anything about gay people except that it was a word we use to mean lame you know i didn't know the specifics <laughs> yeah but then people started to tell me that i was straight and i'm like well i mean yeah i like women but it's never been it, up until that point i never had to accept that as a part of my identity i just was a man or a boy who liked girls and it, it, right. it's, it's not an identi identity issue. It's just, oh, I am going to marry a woman someday and have a billion children. That's just part of my desires rather brilliant. than part of my identity. And so it like really, it really bugged me. And I don't know if I'm, it's, I, I'm not, 
I'm not going to judge myself and say it's not fair for me to think that way because it's just how I have felt. Um, but it's like, I, I, dis, I just have a distaste for that, that someone tells me what I have to call myself. I do not <laughs> appreciate that at all. But one of the things I wanted to mention was the way that Jessica talked about her femininity. And not to put you on blast here, but this is <laughs> a reaction to this type of ideology. Because yeah. I, the, the kind of what I've noticed, and you called it pornified, but what I would say is they have misconstrued femininity with um, performative femininity. Mm -hmm. Because it's not, because femininity, like if you were to look at the norm, it is a person who is more nurturing than a man, typically. It's a person who is a little bit more sensitive than a man. Like there are these things that kind of go across society in a, you know, predictable way. And so there are plenty of things like I would never in my life ever think of Jessica as anything other than feminine. I mean, she is four foot 11. Like, I don't sure. think I, I like that's a hobbit. And if I saw a man that was a four foot 11, I'd be like, Hey there, little guy. What are you? <laughs> but, I'm also, I'm also in the short club. Um, but I just want to say I'm like five, one and a half, five, two. I just want to say to the short kings out there, I love y'all. <laughs> there is lots of really tiny women out there for you. Don't listen to this man. Absolutely. <laughs> All I'm saying, though, is it it troubles me a little bit to hear who, who is clearly a woman, in my opinion, and feminine. Both of you, from looking at you, would ever question your femininity. Like, it's, it's mm -hmm. just a wild thing to hear because I could never view you as anything other than feminine. Well, I have to tell you, um, I really identified with Kat's part of her story where she talked about feeling uncomfortable as a girl and feeling safer in the idea of being masculine. Yeah. And um, it, it didn't really have to do with uh, necessarily not feeling like a woman. So I don't I, I never had gender dysphoria, so I can't identify with that part. But I was raised by a single man. I never had a mother. That man viewed men more um with Favorable. more respect than he re viewed women and i love my dad don't get me wrong he's an awesome person but this is distinctly uh influenced my formation of my psyche so when i was coming up and developing my identity i thought women are ugh, women are you know i don't want to no. i didn't identify with the girls around me i identified more with the men the, the boys i wanted to be one of the boys i ran with the boys i played with the boys I, I joked, I joked, I had the same jokes that the guys did and the girls were off in this different kind of culture that I didn't understand. And so, right. I, although I, I didn't have a discomfort with my body, which is a, a wholly different thing. And I, um, I, I think not enough focus gets placed on the fact that we're not even allowed to call this a mental illness. And in doing so, we rob people who are experiencing pain from receiving um, empathy for that pain. And um, that was something I kind of was addressing in the beginning. But as far as like the uh, psychological aspects of identifying with men more than I identified with women, I, tr I truly experienced that. It yeah. took me into maybe even my 30s before I really started to um, be comfortable with as aspects of my femininity. But yeah. I, I was allowed to do that because I'm part of a different generation that didn't try to say, oh, if you don't like makeup, you might actually be a boy. And this is so superficial and dehumanizing of women. Absolutely. Yeah. So I really identified with what you were saying, Kat. Yeah. Despite my lack of dysphoria, I do understand the misogyny that plays a role in why so many young girls now it's in, and this is what JK uh, Rowling addressed in her open letter is that, you know, we're not seeing this in an even spread across both male and female. We're seeing it largely in teenage girls because of the psychological effects that teenage girls have about not being acceptable persons in our society. And until that ideology, uh, ideology changes, they will by and large, a lot of them experience either wanting 
experimenting with transition, experimenting with sexuality, doing anything they can to not be that thing that is so reviled by our society. And, and can, so, we, can I just say we're reviled sure. by feminists and has been our entire lives? Because feminism, from what I've watched, is always pushing women to be more like men. I, mm. I feel that fem feminism is intimately connected with misogyny. And although it views itself as the counterpoint to it, is in fact a shade of it. So I will clarify mm. my position yeah. with that. And, we'll, we'll, and that also, I think your, Jessica, your particular story about, you know, having a father, but not necessarily having a mother mm -hmm. also colors this conversation in a big way, because I've said for years now that our generation, less so Gen X, but definitely more so even Gen Z, um, there is a profound lack of identity. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems yeah. I think personally with that comes with a lot of broken homes. And I, so I will tell you in advance, I'm going to make a Christian point because that's what I am. So deal with it. <laughs> Go but, for it. Um, I, when it comes to humanity, I think that for one, God shows himself in two ways and he shows a more or less complete view of how he is um, based on the dis distinctive qualities of men and women. And so when you are a child and you are being raised by both a, a good father and a good mother, you are experiencing both sides of that coin and you're able to fully develop a, an identity that's healthy because you see the differences, you see the good, you see the bad, you see all of these different aspects. And I feel like a lot of our generation caught the brunt of divorce waves of mm. families that were broken up and you, you miss these very developmentally important views of men and women. And I feel like there's been a breakdown. Am I crazy to think that? <laughs> um, no, not, not, Oh, sorry. I don't know if you were asking her yeah. or asking me, please go but, ahead. Please. You know, I, you know, I personally, I look at it more from a, scientific and, and sociological perspective is the way I understand it more. But I do think that when we break down these structures that have existed for such a long time and we break them down so rapidly, such as the family, mm -hmm. um, and we're just so quick to discard it and um, to, discard, to discard like our whole understanding of like the relationships between men and women and um, and just when you look at animal species as well, like we are human, so we are more cognitively and like emotionally, um, I don't want to say advanced, but Aware. you know, we're different than other animal species. Um, right. But that doesn't mean like we don't have like a biological basis um, for some of these things. And so when we just discard this and say, well, anyone can be a woman, um, men and women are just exactly alike. And, you know, right. all it is, is, is your aesthetic and, um, you know, as, as far as like, I mean, I, I will say like, you know, not like not everyone is straight, like some people experience homosexual right. attraction. And, and personally, I, I am a supporter of like, equality for gay people and, mm -hmm. and yeah. for them not to be discriminated against or anything like that. So I, I support them. But um, the thing is, is that, you know, some of these patterns of behavior, um, like I think having family, so many more families with divorced parents, so many more single mothers, um, single fathers, whatever. Like I, I do think it has an impact on the youth because um, when one parent's gone, that's when the phone is going to become what they're learning their behavior from is yeah. the internet and yeah. their iPhone. And so they're getting exposed to porn at a young age. They're getting exposed to these trans influencers who are, grooming these kids and telling them what they should believe and telling them you're valid no matter how you are, you know, even if you want to identify as, um, <laughs> I don't know, a penguin, um, that's valid. <laughs> and, and you can wow. be in my family, you can be in my glitter family if, you know, your, your parents don't accept you or if your mom doesn't right. accept you or right. whatever. So, you know, I, I personally like first and second wave feminism. I'm, I'm grateful for a lot of the rights um, 
and a lot of the milestones that were accomplished for women, you know, I'm glad we have the right to vote. <laughs> um, like I, I, I think that there are a lot of, um, I think that, you know, women can be more, women can be whatever they want, right? Like, um, like we can be any type of woman that we want to be. And same thing for, mm -hmm. for men. Like, I don't think that just being one sex or the other, like limit it, limits the kind of person that you can be. Sure. But at the same time, I mean, there it's, I mean, we have instincts, right? Like, uh, humans are not just completely divorced from their biology. And I do think there are biological differences um, and behavioral differences on average between women and men. And yes, like part of feminism has been ignoring that. And it's right. um, it's been thinking that behaviors such as promiscuity, um, you know, not that I judge people for this, but I do think that promiscuity is a lot riskier for women than it is for men. And that naturally we feel more of an aversion to that type of behavior on average mm -hmm. because, you know, biologically it's less beneficial for us than uh it's less natural for us than it is for men and right so you know not that there aren't exceptions to that rule but um but yeah so I don't agree with um a lot of feminist ideas and I do think that some of those ideas did kind of turn around on themselves and become this situation that we find ourselves in right now with trans ideology so you sorry go ahead Kim I was just going to add, here's, here, I need to ask you a question because maybe you mm -hmm. can shed light on it because it makes, it's outside of my realm. Um, when people say they don't feel like a girl or don't feel like a boy, this in my mind makes zero sense to me because <laughs> simply because I have grown up with all of the accoutrement of a boy, of a man. And so I, I've had all of the, the hormones. I've had all of the things that, that come naturally as being a man. And so, like, for me, when my friend uh, who transitioned from a man to or a woman to a man came to me and asked me how I grow a beard, I was flabbergasted because I just didn't shave. Like, there was no, there was no rhyme or reason to it. It was just, this is what grew out of my face. And so when someone says they don't feel like a man or don't feel like a woman, I have no point of reference because I've never been a woman. How is that a statement that makes any sense? Like, I just can't, I, I can't wrap my mind around that. That is such an excellent point. And I'm looking, I, I need to plug in my device is the only thing really, really quick. My I'm getting low yeah, batteries, yeah, so totally. I just want to plug it in so I don't lose you guys. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Please do. Um, I actually, that's a question that I had wanted to ask too. Um, and I wrote down when she first started talking, I was like, what does gender dysphoria feel like? Yeah. Cause because it's like, I, I can't wrap my head around it. Cause I don't, as a, a, a masculine person with right. masculine features and a masculine brain, because those hormones affect your brain. Sure. Like, yeah, absolutely. I, there is no way for me to leave that experience. And that's There's no kind way for of me like, to judge it against any other. And that's what I think is such a dangerous thing about not no longer being allowed to call gender dysphoria a mental illness is that it robs the recognition that people are sort of like suffering from um, not having like comfort in their own bodies. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's not something that we can understand through a lived experience. And so um, Kat, that we, we were just kind of discussing um, how I had wanted to ask that same question. And the way that I had phrased it is like, what does gender or body dysphoria feel like? Like, cause we don't have a frame of reference for that. We don't experience it. It is actually like a, 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 a mental, uh, I don't want to say defect. Defect is the wrong word, but like something has gone awry that you yeah. are in a body yes. that you don't feel in place with. And if you could kind of help uh, feel that. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to give a shout out to a fellow uh, YouTuber um, that I highly recommend you check out his video on this exact topic, but it's, it's called something like the five types of gender dysphoria, something okay. like that. And his channel name is Cluniac. But okay. um so the thing with dysphoria is, um, and that these are, I've come to some of his same conclusions sort of like independently and through research I've done as well, but he just had a really good explanation. But I don't, one thing that isn't um, highlighted enough 
um, especially by trans activists, is that gender dysphoria can happen for very different reasons in different people, right? Like it is, it's it's more of a symptom than like a standalone yeah. condition, you know, like, uh, like when I was a teenager and it was kind of before the whole trans craze took off, like, you yeah, know, at that craze. time, at that time, anorexia and like cutting uh, self-harm right. were um, the big things, right? And it's like, so you had a bunch of girls that had trauma in their lives. And, you know, at this time, the media was really covering like the stories of like anorexics and bulimics. Like that was kind of like a craze. There were a lot of books coming out about it. And, you know, girls would find out about that. And it would, it would be, that would be their outlet for like, you know, trauma, teenage angst, um, like whatever it is. And now it's gender dysphoria, right? Um, right. I, I feel like it's just the next generation of and trauma autism. and autism as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, but the thing is, is like not everybody is experiencing dysphoria because of trauma. Some people have autogynephilia. I don't know if you have heard of that. Yeah, this, but... I, I, I lacked the terminology when I was talking earlier about men who actually have um, a right, sexual right. kink as opposed to gender uh, dysphoria. I think that's the actual term for it. Right. right. So, so yeah, auto, autogynephilia is basically, um, you know, it's, it's a paraphilia where you are sexually attracted to the idea of being a woman or you're sexually attracted to yourself as a woman, um, specifically like a male person who, um, as Cam was saying, doesn't actually know what it's like to be a woman because a woman is an adult human female. So how would they know? But I don't believe it's, um, I mean, maybe some of it could come from trauma, but I don't think that these, you know, 40 year old men suffering with AGP, well, not suffering necessarily, <laughs> but, you know, um, that have AGP, like, I don't think that their dysphoria is the same experience or has the same roots as someone who is like a teenage girl that, um, that has gender dysphoria and, you know, people with all types of mental illnesses, like personality disorders are one too, where like with, um, borderline personality disorder, which like, I've also had that diagnosis and that gives you a very unstable sense of identity. So yeah. Um, and you can right. kind of go from one identity to another and like, and um, kind of try to find yourself externally rather than having this like core sense of who you are. And you can grasp on to like right. other identities, um, you know, narcissistic personality disorder as well. Um, I think that goes along with AGP a lot. And um, to cite a study, I don't remember the name of the study, like I could find it uh, maybe after we get off, but it's something like 80% of trans identified people do have comorbid mental health conditions. It's like a yeah. huge number. And so there almost always is something else going on. Um, yeah, autism is another thing that can kind of cause an unstable sense of identity, um, you know, in a way similar to like borderline personality disorder. So you have gender dysphoria, which is just the sensation of, um, it's being uncom uncomfortable in your body, feeling, you know, disgust or just discontent towards your physical body, especially your, you know, physical sex characteristics. And you have this craving to become either something else or, um, you know, non-binary people like that have dysphoria. They don't actually want to be a man or they don't actually want to be a woman. They're just they don't want to be what they are. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, See, that's that's something I can wrap my head around because <clears throat> I can understand like not feeling like you belong in your body like that kind of makes sense because like I to, to put it is I'm a joker, but I shouldn't be in this fat body. I understand that. Like I can I can understand that this is or not like, what it should look like. Like I or get it's that. like a pubescent teenager i remember very much feeling like what is going on with my body yeah. and being disgusted by it like why the, is all this hair coming in places it shouldn't you know like <laughs> yeah but the idea that i could cognitively feel like a woman like i just i i think it's just for me there's this i don't know if it's a block or i'm not i, I don't think i'm wrong but i'm not saying i couldn't be um, but 
I just feel like it's impossible for me to feel like something I'm not physically. Well, I, I think just... a lot of it, I think a lot of it is that a lot of these people are either gay or they're gender, gender non-conforming naturally. So they don't really fit, um, you know, society's expectations of males and females. And, you know, same thing, someone with autism, a lot of times doesn't fit that either. Like, you know, the gender stereotypes that we, um, associate with males and females which like you know i think a lot of those stereotypes are toxic and that we should be working to judge people less according to that but you know uh, like when i was not passing as a man but i had like a shaved head and i was wearing very masculine clothing and like you know society really doesn't treat you in the same way like they don't treat you people are so nice to me if i go out in a dress like literally people i get compliments like people are just will come up and strike a conversation with me. But like when I was gender, not when I was presenting more gender nonconforming, like people just don't treat you the same way. And then if you're, no. you know, especially if you're gay um, or bisexual, it's, it's like um, you can have like internalized homophobia or just internalized shame at like not fitting, not living up to society's expectations. And that can make you start to feel like, well, you know, maybe I was supposed to be born like a girl or supposed to be born a boy. And then that kind of develops into like an an identity over time. And like, what's so toxic right now is like, we have books like I am jazz that are being distributed in elementary schools. So, um, you know, in the past it was like, it was a very rare situation where a kid would actually present with um, legitimate gender dysphoria where they were just on their own say, mom, I feel like a girl or, you know, that used to be a very rare phenomenon and and transgender transgenderism was considered extremely rare until recently but like now you you have kids learning about it so young that you can't separate like like for instance I learned about eating disorders when I was pretty young like I I think I probably read about a girl with anorexia when I was like 10 years old or something like that that was when that was a real craze and I do think that had an effect of how my mental illness manifested you know Mm -hmm. and similarly like I discovered my first trans website around the same, I think I was more like 12 or 13, you yeah. know, and when you have suddenly an answer of like, well, this is why I feel different than other kids. Like, this is why, you know, I don't fit in or um, I've, you say like, well, I'm really just a boy in a girl's body. And uh, you know, it kind of, I, I, so I think that is um, like, it's easier for a person. They have so much trauma around who they are, which is honestly heartbreaking, you know, but people have yeah. so much trauma about who they are and how it's not okay to be who they are that they just think, well, it would be easier to, you know, to be a woman than who I am. And that turns into like, well, I actually am a woman. Like I have a female brain. I'm a woman yeah. in a man's body or like vice versa. Right. Yeah. Well, it, do, it does seem like um, I'm not saying that a gender binary is by any means bad. I'm not I'm not making any claims on that. But I feel like the view of it has been hurtful because Mm. if you don't feel like you fit in your body, then obviously the only other option is that you are a girl. The other. Yeah. Right. The opposite. Rather than going, perhaps I am a man who is more sensitive. Perhaps I am a man who is more nurturing. Perhaps I am a man who likes flair. Like, (laughs) <laughs> it's it's it seems that they've turned like because it's one of those like as a as I was growing up like of course there were you know kind of strict ideas of what man and female man and woman were but like my I heard throughout my life even through TV and through my parents that you know a man is allowed to cry a man can experience these emotions and that was like, okay, cool. Yeah. So I'm not a woman just because I'm, I, I feel this way just right. because I cried at the end of old yeller. Like I'm not a woman because <laughs> of that. Right. But it does seem that there has been an ideological push, which conflicts with all of the, with the, uh, the rest of the feminist ideology somehow <laughs> that if a girl likes playing with trucks or a boy shows nurturing through playing with a baby doll that that must necessarily make them the opposite gender 
rather right. than a man who is good with children. God forbid we have fathers who <laughs> like their kids. I like yeah. at least half yeah. of my kids. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> you like 2.5 of your kids. <laughs> yeah. And it That's switches right. day to day. There's there are a couple <laughs> of constants in there, but half of them, like, you know, they swap, swap in and out there, but no, it's, it's just wild that we don't allow men to be both masculine in the, the stereotypical way of going in, conquering a mountain and climbing a mountain, but also let his wife come with him and do the same. Right. Like it's just an insanity to me that you can't have <laughs> shared experiences and shared interests. I, like what? I I right. have this, I have this story. It's really quick too, where I was in my twenties and um, for most of my youth, like my wild youth in the city, I lived with gay men. Because um, I ran with the boys, but most of the boys were gay. <laughs> um, and so I made I made a, a friend, a friend who was a girl. It was one of my first girlfriends um, at the restaurant that I worked at. And one day she had this awful thing happen to her. And she came to me. She was crying. She wanted comfort, female comfort. And I was like completely emotionally unprepared to deal with a crying woman. And, and like, I so can deal with that. Like, that's not, I, that's not hard for me. I said to her, she's crying and she's emoting to me. And I was like, are you sure you don't want me to go get one of the gays? And she's like, no, I need to talk to a girl. And I'm like, yeah, I think I might go get one of the gays. <laughs> like, <laughs> because I just like, um, they would have been my, especially my, my specifically my roommate, who was my maid of honor actually, um, would have been better at like dealing with a crying woman than I was. And like, that didn't make him a woman or me a man. It's just like right. we were just uh, emotionally different in that way, and like that didn't What's... that didn't necessitate us cutting any parts of ourselves off, which it <laughs> seems to now. What's yeah. <laughs> wrong with viewing people as individuals? Right. Thank you. What's Thank wrong you, with that? I threw um, my pen. But... I can't write anything else now. <laughs> so I, I don't. If you have a response to our our diatribes, just then feel free. Um, but you did talk about a political awakening, and I will let oh, you yeah. know. I wanted. To we to also that. have had our own political awakenings throughout uh, throughout time, and Jessica and I are in a very similar place um, when it comes to now. politics. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but okay, it's it sounds well, a we little came bit from opposite places. Oh yeah. Kind of like, oh kind yeah. Of, like. Um, I used to be they, a wild leftist commie. So, <laughs> and I grew up in a Reagan and Republican household. So I grew up neocon. Okay. Um, but the, to put it as simply as possible without making it too awkward, um, we kind of are in this anarchist um, adjacent area where we don't mm. really want the government, to put it simply, adjacent. But like, I could get into the specifics, but we are, it sounds like you've had some red pill moments, mm. but I, I would clarify personally that the red pill doesn't necessarily mean you become a Republican. Sometimes it just means you, what it means is you reject the common narrative. And like what the matrix version of what a red right. pill is. Basically. Right. And so we're right. very interested in exploring this because you've, you've expressed interest and we, I just want to let you know, we're probably going to understand because we've been on all, we've been on all of it. We've been everywhere, man. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. what was your political awakening? I'd love to, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I like to say that as I went back to, as I went from identifying as non-binary to going back to living as a woman, I became politically non-binary. Um, okay. <laughs> because, uh, so the trans issue on the left right now is like, it's like the issue, right? It's like the hot button issue. I yeah, mean, they took it's over just, from the gay issue. Yeah. And just the fact that it's like getting written into like legal policies and stuff like that, like without there being a vote, without even like asking the public, like asking women if they want to be called birthing people, like it's just, Ugh. okay, we'll just write that in. And like 
the sports teams and the, I mean, well, that's more up to the sports league, but um, you know, the, the prisons like in California um, when a male in a male rapist even is like, um, it, it, you know, goes to prison or whatever, he can identify into the woman's prison. And this is like apparently fine according to California law, mm -hmm. which is just obviously insane. And um, <laughs> so <laughs> as soon as I started talking about this issue and, you know, talking about, well, you know what, I don't really agree with some of what's going on. Um, it's like one of the things that all of the, you know, TRAs, trans rights activists would say to try to insult me is like, oh, you're conservative, like you're far right. <laughs> and you're just like pretending, you're just <laughs> pretending to be on our side, but like you're, you're a secret Republican. And like, you know, my family was very left leaning growing up. And um, so like, I mean, honestly, uh, <laughs> when I was a kid, my family used to sit at a table and instead of playing old maid, we would play old Republican. <laughs> like um, <laughs> that was what we called it and so I always did kind of I thought all of the ideas that you know are considered on the right were right. just bad because they were on the right and like that's the way that I thought and but I thought the left was totally fine you know I thought yeah. like well we're like we're the good side and all of our, our ideas are right like we're the party of compassion and right. you know we care about people and like Republicans you know don't care about others at all they're just selfish and um but like right about then when I started questioning like this one idea on the left it just kind of it shattered my paradigm in like right. in a big way and I started seeing the issues as like independent issues mm -hmm. you know instead of like well I disagree with all this checklist of issues on the right or like I disagree with all of this on the left like I I, I don't see it anymore as like you have to accept one or the other. You have to accept all of the issues or you're like not a member of that tribe anymore. Right. Um, and like, honestly, yeah, some people on the left treated me horribly and still treat me horribly for like talking about this trans thing. And they try to dismiss me by saying like, I'm conservative and it's just really crazy. And then I've talked to a lot of conservatives, you know, like because um, when I started posting about detransitioning, I got like, the most diverse audience that like one yeah. could have like i've got young people i've got old people i've got you know everyone in between and the political spectrum too like i've got leftists i have conservatives i've got independents yep. um so it's like i started just talking to more people and i started talking to conservatives and like <laughs> most of them are not horrible people like um most of them are you know they have their opinions on the issues, but they are not coming up from a place of hatred or, right. um, or, or bigotry or anything like that. You know, I mean, people on both sides can be uninformed sometimes and yeah. can spread misinformation just like, you know, like, like, I think we all have like bias blind spots. Right. And I think sometimes like if we are really affiliated with like one group, it can be easy for us to be like, Oh, well that's like, part of this group and what we believe so like I'll just kind of like overlook it and I, I yeah. think that's how the trans issue has gotten so big it's just you know the left kind of turning a blind eye and being like well you know we support uh we support equality and we support LGBT so and you know how the T ever got included with the LGB is like like that's you, a whole nother story I, but can I ask because I come from exactly that perspective like that's right in line with what happened to me. My red pill moment was sort of a, a, a different thing. Um, but similarly, I was, um, it was a paradigm shattering and people who I thought might were my friends like rounded on me really fast and it was traumatic in a way. Um, but I see that culture, even though I stepped back, kind of like continuing and leaving me behind, whereas my values didn't really change. That whole paradigm just sort of like, kept moving left you and oh, it yeah. left me and i'm wondering and i i wonder this aloud a lot um do you think there's a high watermark do you think there's a place where people come to their senses and turn around and say okay we've gone way too far we've allowed this to like completely overtake everything and um we need to reclaim some rationality or do you think that there is no ceiling <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know what? I, I think that, um, 
you know, not to, uh, not to push this like too much, but I really think that this trans issue is a ceiling for some people. Like I think when some people learn that kids are being medically transitioned and, you know, kids are being put on puberty blockers as young as 10 and having yeah. surgery at 13 and some of the stuff that's yeah. going on, um, or, you know, the, the rapists in women's prisons, like that's another yeah. big hot button, uh, issue. And yeah, I think that that is kind of a, a peak moment for a lot of people. Um, you know, there's, there's like some other issues as well that I, I'm not going to go into detail because I, I feel like I am most informed about like yeah. the gender issue and I sure, do have my sure. opinions on other stuff, but I don't necessarily want to talk with like authority on that or anything, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I think for some people there is a ceiling, but I think that there are some people who are honestly fueled by narcissism and they have to be right. And I, I think that, um, you know, there's just this belief like among leftists, like we are the party of morality, like, like we're right. the party that cares about others and like the mm -hmm. other side is evil. Mm -hmm. And like, I think believe like really ha believing that like also leads to you believing that you can do no wrong and that like your party will always be right. Yeah. And so that really scares me as far as like the trajectory of the left. And like, that's why I really don't support um, like the leftist politicians anymore. Like, yeah. I don't feel like voting for them would represent my beliefs. And yeah. I mean, honestly, even just like, even just the whole transitioning kids issue, like that That's is our future one. generation right there. Right. Like this is who, um, like this is who's going to be caring for us when we get old and like, who yeah, worry about is that a little bit. Future, <laughs> who is the future of our country. And it's like, we are sterilizing them and we yeah. are giving them brain damage and it's, you know, it's this really like um, crazy cultish ideology that is being pushed as fact. And that is what kids are now being indoctrinated with um, in schools. So it's especially like I'm in California, you know, so it's it's really, really it's, it's a, here is a severe case. Like some of the craziest yeah. laws are like in in this country. Um, other states like I'm happy I I'm happy to see that they're starting to try to protect trans, uh, trans identified children and they're trying to preserve, you know, female sports and like, you know, people think I'm like super conservative because of that. But I mean, I just, I, I just think it's right. And it's true. Like, it's not about whether it's like a red or blue right. issue. Right. Um, so, so yeah, I have had kind of like this, uh, this awakening in terms of like, politics and I just really want to be well informed about all the issues and like just make my own decision uh to the best of my knowledge um rather than just blindly going with like a tribe and like yeah yes yeah. I do think that there's just more and more ideology getting added to the left like every day like in echo chambers and it's yeah like and I had to leave I couldn't my experience couldn't with that my experience with that too is like the ever changing terminology is purposeful. It's there's a sense of power that comes with it because if you know all the correct terms, you're in the in group. Yeah. And so when group. that when that um set of terms is constantly changing, just your regular everyday kind of like normie person who wants to go along to get along could never possibly keep up with all of this. Yeah. So you've so, always got this thing that you're like hanging over people's head, like the sword of Damocles, which mm. is like, Oh, you didn't really, um, you're actually a bigot and you didn't even realize it because you didn't know what X, Y, Z term was. And guess what? That means that you are one of the bad people. Now I've got this cudgel that I can like beat you into submission with because nobody wants to be a bigot. Nobody wants to be called a racist. Nobody wants to be called a homophobe. They are not any of these things. And the people accusing them of it know that these people yeah. are not any of these things, but they know I gain power if I accuse you of it. And if Absolutely. you're accused, you will bend over backwards to do anything that I want you to do. Yeah, I think this is right. this is one of those things that like is very evident 
in the gender conversation, but so much of it is so beyond the pale that most mm -hmm. people don't even want to deal with it. Most yeah. normal human beings don't want to deal with it. But I think the best examples of this are in the race conversations, such mm -hmm. as like, you know, at, there has been a shift in language on how to um, how to refer to people who are black. So at one mm -hmm. point it was you call them African Americans. That's not right. in vogue anymore. It it now became calling POCs. them black. Yeah, calling them black, and then it was calling them POCs. Then now it's uh, BIPOC, BIPOC. Oh right. I think so ever changing, an, ever changing. Yeah. And if you listen to the people who were on the forefront of it, who are pushing the ideological in group um, signaling, it, there's there's the term foundational Americans rather than even black or white or BIPOC or POC. So it's always a an always it's a target that's always moving. It's goalposts that are yeah. always changing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's. It's, I think that race is, it's, it's one of those that started taking the backseat because a lot of people were using the word racist so flippantly that it lost all meaning. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that there is a, there has been a concerted shift in the conversation there, but I do think that there's competing narratives between race conversation and gender conversation that I've noticed. They're totally. trying to find precedence. And it's 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 really difficult because, you know, I uh, the clearest way I describe kind of where we are isn't even exact or precise. But if you boil it down to where I am, where Jessica is, it has a lot to do with peace, with freedom, with things like not killing each other. You know, like these are the important issues that we deal with is, you know, not killing each other. <laughs> you know, we want good things to happen, but it's hard to describe any of this without naming a tribe. And a lot of times right. those tribes come with so much baggage that even mentioning a word that directly talks about them can color ev everything you say to everyone because you chose a label. You just feel the that energy in the room shift because of it. It's interesting that you said that um, you think it all boils down to, and then you said peace, because I was thinking as you were saying that it all boils down to power because there's a lot of, um, I'm saying way for that us, the, we want peace. Oh, they for want us, power. Yeah. Right. Whereas like the, the, what Kat was talking about uh, with the way that the government is shifting under this premise of like protecting trans people's rights when there was never even a conversation held with the general public about right. what we'd actually like to do as far as like gendered spaces goes, for example. Yeah. Um, An it, example it, it, of, it, it, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to, I really want to quickly wanted to um, set an example of how that's happening in the race discussion as well. Yeah. There was a big thing about the term Latin X like yeah, that's that what I was going to go to as well. Got thrown around like a lot. I don't know if it was written into legal docu documents or not. Um, I'm not sure about that, but I know I was hearing it on campus at UC Santa Cruz um, all the, the time. Hate it. And yeah, like it's not even a letter that's like in their language. <laughs> and like they were right. not asked. <laughs> like there was never like a vote uh, on how they wanted to be referred to. And so some of these terms that are being made up by the left it's like it's like who really decides these things like is it is it really you know is it is it really black people or is it just like a bunch of white people who think they're being allies that right. just want to create a new term to like ostracize people is kind yeah, of how much of is it division how much right. of it is like how i know that like i don't want to be seen as the white guy i my skin is white I have a lot of heritage that's very white, but is that how I want to be seen or do I want to be seen as an individual? Like that's inherently, mm -hmm. I want to be seen as Cam. I want to be seen okay. as my specific circumstances. I want to see be seen as my specific needs, desires, etc. And how it seems incredibly unfair, which fairness is 
if you really look at it, is kind of like a non-term. Mm -hmm. Because how do you describe fair? Because it's always an assertion. But what is reasonable? What is it that people want and have said that they want or didn't even know they needed to express that they want? But there are people at the top who are like, oh, oh, so you're from Mexico. Oh, you're from Honduras. Oh, you're from Colombia. So you are Latinx, Latinx, if you want to say it phonetically. Like, how is that something that's reasonable to push on people? Just this is the same discussion, I think, as when I said that I have a certain distaste for the word cisgender. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with the Latinx thing specifically, I've looked a little bit into this. Um, a lot of the people who initially introduced that term are themselves of Latin heritage, okay. but they are Americanized yeah. people whose grandparents or parents may come from Latin countries. They may have um, Latin in their heritage, but they're very much liberalized, Americanized people. And then so they're turning around and this expression of their identity is coming out in this very Americanized, liberalized way. Whereas if you go and talk to people who are coming from Honduras, who are coming from Colombia, who are coming from Mexico, and you bring this term to them who actually like are fully Latin in the sense of like they have arrived here as immigrants, they don't understand this terminology and it seems at least from some of the like the videos and the things that I've read it feels to them very robbing of their identity so it's yeah. sort of like this blending of Americanization liberalization and Latin identity that has come up with this like sort of third thing so it's no longer totally. Latino it's no longer American it's something other which is Latin X and I don't I don't think that those people don't deserve to have a specific identity unto themselves, but they do not have the right to impose it on either Americans or Latino people right. when it is just specifically their subsect of a thing. And these are also like um, come from the university. It's very, very specific to university educated second or third generation latin americans who are very liberalized and americanized and so there's layers of culture being implanted in here that no you're not just latino you're also american and that's where this whole x is coming from right let me ask you a question um and i forgot it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because we're oh, okay. now we're now we're two hours in and we've been drinking. So now comes the like we, the stuttering. Oh, that's what stuttering. It was. There we go. Um, there we well, go. no, this is just this is pure ADD. Um, but okay, so you had said that a lot of people are narcissistic and they want to be right. Mm -hmm. And what I would posit, which I kind of posited in your introduction, is I would say that a lot of times it maybe narcissism plays a role in so far as people want to feel justified in whatever they're saying, whatever they believe, et cetera. But how many people do you think that it is a well thought out or well researched position rather than programming? Because mm -hmm. it seems to me that a lot of the people who I've seen, um, on even on some of your TikTok comments that are not responding from a place of thought, but they they seem to be responding from a common script. Right. Oh. Um, That's a great point. Yeah, I think a lot of like the younger people, because um, like sometimes it's like someone will be super rude to me on TikTok and just just parrot like the talking points of like trans activists while like insulting me right and that happens a lot um and then I look at their page and they're like you know a 15 year old or something and like usually I'll just block them because I'm like you know they don't need to be seeing my content anyway like uh I don't know like your brain isn't fully developed until 25 um like the prefrontal yeah. cortex isn't even fully developed until 25 um so you know they're not going to understand like it's uh 
so it's, you know, mostly the kids. I don't know if I would call them narcissistic. I think they are more programmed. And I think that um, they have a high incentive to believe in this trans ideology because, you know, it's, it is, I mean, it is a form of self-harm, right? Like it's, mm, yeah. it's an immediate relief for an emotional and psychological pain um, that is deeper. Like, so, no, let, well, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say the way you described that just then, an immediate relief for a psychological pain actually reminds me of how um, my mother would describe suicide, which mm -hmm. was as a, a, a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, self-harm too. Um, like even if the person doesn't go all the way with that, I mean, if you're cutting off body parts <laughs> and, you know, you're taking drugs that cause... Um, you know, with puberty blockers, um, they're particularly dangerous because they don't only, they don't just cause brain damage; they cause the brain to never develop in the way that yeah. it's supposed to develop. Um, yeah. And there is limited research on this, but um, you know, during puberty is when your brain goes through. Like, it's not just when the sex organs develop. It's um, there's a particularly timed sequence of events. You know, where your, t your estrogen, your testosterone increases and um, the brain is making changes at the same time, responding to these like very specific levels of these hormones. And right. also your bones are thickening up and your, your growth plates are closing and uh, your, your bones are increasing in density. So there's all these like particular kind of events that are happening. So that is actually a process. Yes, absolutely. Oh, I mean, wow. as, because yeah, during the teenage years, um, and I think early 20s as well, um, I'd have to look up at the exact age, but there's a particular period of time where you're supposed to have a dramatic increase in bone density. Um, you know, it's where your bones stop lengthening, they stop growing, and they close off and increase in density. And that's supposed to be your bone density for like the rest of your life. Um, and people who were on blockers, not only did the density not increase, but it actually decreased um, while they were on the blockers. So then, yeah, you're going into your 20s with low bone density. You're probably going into your 30s with osteopenia. And it's just, you know, even grown men, even fully grown men that were on puberty blockers, I think for prostate cancer um, or, or some other health condition, obviously, that isn't related to puberty. But um, there's been studies that showed they had an increase in, in, in bone fractures as mm -hmm. well. So this is a severe form of self harm. And um, so yeah, these kids are thinking they want these things. They are, um, you know, saying I hate my body so much, I want to transition, I want to transition. Um, a lot of them are actually self harming and cutting themselves as well. Um, you know, they're having surgery sometimes as young as 13. And so for them, I think they are indoctrinated and it's not, it's just them trying to feel better, honestly. And when someone challenges is that challenges that they tend to lash out because that's yeah. taking away their coping mechanism. And, but, I, I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, just, I'll just finish up really quick. I was, mm -hmm. but um, just to compare that with the activists, um, they're the ones that I think are, um, a lot of them are very dangerous, um, narcissistic, sociopathic, yeah. um, cult leaders. Yeah. Like, I, I think that they actually target kids and, yeah. um, you know, a lot of them probably have other paraphilias uh, besides mm. just autogynophilia or whatever. I think a lot of them are actually, well, I don't want to sound too conspiratorial, no, but no, I'm, I'm where you have one paraphilia. You say, yes, we, we're with you. We understand. We're with you. Okay. <laughs> well, I just see, you know, I see the sexualization of kids and the and the, the fact that they're pushing for discussion of, you know, sexual concepts and things younger and younger. And they're, they're fighting so hard to get this taught in schools. They're fighting so hard to eliminate the boundaries for, you know, like there was a news article recently on like how a non-binary counselor who was, you know, um, he was, he was biologically male was sleeping in cabins with, um, like junior high school girls and things like that. So this is the type of thing that these activists are pushing for. So I think when there's one paraphilia, there's probably others that are even darker that are happening. So, so these people I think are actually dangerous. I don't think they care about anyone but themselves. And 
Um, I think they are absolutely grooming kids and going after kids. So yes, no, we, so, we, yeah. I'm on the same page as you in, I, I think that it is prevalent in academia, particularly philosophical areas mm -hmm. of ac academia, it seems. Um, but it's also just through the paying attention to history. It is prevalent both in Hollywood and it is prevalent in the government. And the, yes. I, I, I could I could talk about that all day. I won't. But this I, is I, this is not something we haven't noticed. I do want to ask you, being that you were a young person who went through this and your parents probably did what I think most parents would do if their kid came to them and said, I feel like I'm the wrong gender, taking you to a doctor who identifies themselves as a gender professional. And mm -hmm. as we heard you describe earlier, this person within a single appointment affirmed this, which I mean, I... When I was a young person, I remember, I don't know if you guys remember that show Real Sex 25 on HBO, which is where most people in my generation learned about sex from, <laughs> but because <laughs> our parents were too afraid to talk to us about it and schools only taught abstinence only sex ed. So mm. if you wanted to learn about like the world of sex, there was a show on HBO called Real Sex 25. And it was the first place I ever heard of transgender people. It was the first place I ever heard about sex toys, about prostitution i was probably mm. way too young to be watching this program just like any other you know teen young teen at the time but you have curiosity about your burgeoning sexuality and so you go to these sources because your parents are either ill-equipped or unwilling to talk to you about it and one of the things i learned on real sex 25 about gender transition or transgender at the time was that it took 12 years of psychotherapy before you would be affirmed as the opposite gender and allowed to go through the process of surgical transition. So a lot of people in that day and age were actually flying to places like Thailand um, and other Asian countries in order to receive gender, uh, what we now call gender affirming surgeries. Um, because in the United States, you would have to go through a minimum of 12 years of psychotherapy before you would be uh, given permission to go through this extreme body change. Now we have right. self-affirming uh, transgender where you decide for yourself that you're transgender or a doctor who you as a parent probably very innocently say, okay, my kid has come to me. They said they don't feel like they're the right gender. I'm going to take them to a doctor. That seems a very reasonable, rational response. As we've learned, these doctors are not necessarily trustworthy in terms of the care of our children. So in that light, if I'm a, a parent and my child comes to me and says, I don't feel like I'm the right gender, what do we do? Yeah, well, the first thing is to not uh, take them to a gender therapist. <laughs> um, <laughs> they cannot be trusted. They are, are not impartial about, like, they're definitely ideologically motivated. Um, right. So far, I have not heard of anyone that they did not affirm. Right. So, uh, you know, every trans kid, I, I, I haven't fact, check, fact check, checked the statistic exactly, so... Like, don't quote me on this, but I know it is a high number. Um, but I read that uh, every kid that becomes a trans kid and, and medically transitions um, equals one million dollars for the pharmacy, the pharmaceutical industry um, over their lifetime. So I think a lot of these organizations, um, you know, a lot of these providers are trying to make money. Um, you know, I, for some of them, I, I really think that's what it is. And for some of them, I think they're just afraid of losing their job if they don't affirm because that's what trans activists are pushing for. And they are bullying people and threatening people. Um, you know, they've already gotten people sacked from academia and yep. just, I mean, it's, it's, they have a lot of power and some of these trans lobbyists, lobbyists, um, are actually very well off and they have millions, some of them billions of dollars. So um, wow. they have the power to cancel people and get, make them lose their jobs. So 
you know, even doctors that are not like gender doctors will affirm um, just because they're afraid to lose their job. So, so yeah, um, what I, unfortunately, like, I don't have any like simple answers, um, but, you know, exploratory therapy, I think is really important. Just finding someone for your kid to talk to who isn't going to immediately affirm and which is, you know, it's harder and harder these days, but, you know, I feel like talking to the therapist beforehand and asking them their thoughts on it and just trying to get a really good read on the person um, is important. And also, I just think it's so important. I think a lot of par parents are being blindsided by this ideology, right? Like they don't even know their kid is learning about this stuff until they come yeah. home from school and say, oh, I learned that some kids are born in the wrong body today. Or like I learned they're a five-year-old saying like, oh, um, well, our teacher is non-binary and uh, you know, not, not only identifies as non-binary, but is teaching this ideology like in class. And, you know, there's been teachers of like young children posting on TikTok that they are teaching kids this stuff. I don't know if it's actually part oh, of the curriculum fun. or not. Um, I think in some cases it is, definitely in California it is. But I think parents need to preemptively um, like prepare their children for this. Like, you know, um, I'm, I don't have any children currently, but like I, I, I would like to have children and I, I don't even know if I'm going to send them to public school. Um, like I'll, I'd rather homeschool them, honestly, if it's, if I can. And so yeah, homes, <laughs> homeschooling if it's possible. Um, and if it's not, you know, cause I know that's not an option for every parent, but preparing your kids beforehand and making sure that you, you introduce them to, the ideology but in a way as like this is what some people believe as if it's like I don't know um like some people believe in like witchcraft or or whatever or like they believe in fairies uh right like whatever like like teach it in, as like this is something that some people believe this is not fact like here's here's yeah. the actual scientific evidence like you know they probably can't understand all of it but you know, as they grow, you can, you can share that with them. And, you know, unfortunately in this day and age, it is still possible that a kid could identify as trans, like despite preparing them for, for all of this. But I feel like at least preemptively, like introducing them to the ideas yourself rather than, rather than them being taught these ideas at school from a teacher right. as if it's fact can, you know, at least give them like a grain of salt. Um, I think, to just blindly accepting these ideas. I think one of the problems um, today is that many parents don't realize how young um, some of this ideology is being introduced in schools. I come from a pretty rural area in the South, which is shocking to me that some of the people who have young children in my church have told me that their, you know, seven or eight year old has come home to them and said, mom, how do I know I'm really a girl? Mom, how oh, do goodness. I know I'm really a boy? And we're talking about kids who are like second grade, maybe. And I've heard other people bemoaning the fact that they can't introduce LGBT uh, terms to kindergartners. And so there is like a push younger and younger to where I think like the normal average go along to get along kind of person is not going to think, well, they're not teaching my seven year old about transgender, but they are. Right. You know, right. And even if it's not happening at the child's particular school, like, you know, Nickelodeon or has a non-binary character and like you've got the book I Am Jazz um, being in school libraries. And it, it's like you have all these in, and then they have technology now, you know, they're getting like phones and stuff younger and younger. Right. And right. Um, I think that it's hard to know how young your child is being exposed to stuff and it's just it's really crazy that to think that a school could teach a kid about gender identity and that they could be in the wrong body and then your kid could come out as transgender and I'm, I'm sure both of you as parents like uh, I it must be difficult to be in your position but you know this the school could then affirm your child's gender identity without having to tell you the parents and um, it's not in every state, but um, 
I think it might have been Oregon. It is legal for kids to um, get testosterone and uh, chest surgery um, without the parents being informed. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's like 14 or 16 years old. And I'd have to find this for sure. But I know I read that in some states, these uh, medically affirming pr procedures are available without the parents' consent. So Did it's just, it's, it's, it's really pulling apart families. I mean, the school should not become the child's family. You know, no. trans influencers should not become the child's parents. Like, it's, it's just insane that this is happening. And there are places where um, if your family doesn't affirm your identity, you can run away from home. And these places, they're like youth hostels that will take in youth who apparently their parents don't affirm their transgender identity, can't imagine why, um, that are like actively encouraging, in my mind, people to leave their home, who in your home, it's not always the case, um, but that is usually the people who care most about what happens to you in the world. Even when you're in the throes of your um, adolescence, which I, I remember being an adolescent and thinking that my parents were just the worst people on earth. Now as an adult, I look back on how, you know, they were actually protecting me from myself. And I think that right. there's this idea being planted in young children's minds. that says, if your parents don't go along with every thought that runs through your head, you can run away from there and be with people who will welcome you into their glitter family who are in fact people who are grooming you um, to be abused. Right. And, and told that your parents are horrible. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ken. No, 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 no. You're good. I, I was just going to say, Jessica, what's that Stalin quote about schooling or is it linen? Um, man, I can't remember off the top of my head. You go um, ahead. I'm going to Google it real quick. Go you ahead. go. Yeah. Go ahead. So, but uh, I, I do think that there is, are people who have, um, uh, you know, I I'm trying to think of a genteel way to say this, but I, I guess I just won't. I think that there are people who are looking to victimize your children who are taking advantage of this ideology, who are convincing vulnerable kids who are having identity issues that they can run away from home into the bosom of people who will eat them alive and um, do not care what happens to them, do not care about their futures, do not care that they will um, be four times more at risk for suicide, uh, four times more at risk for heart attacks and ovarian cancers. Um, this is not what's running through these people's heads. And not only that, even if they're not looking to groom you for some kind of purpose of their own, they want you to go along with something that is affirming to their own identity. And this is just kind of like my right. read on the issue. Absolutely. Go ahead. The Go linen ahead, quote is, give me four years to teach the children and the seed I have sown will never be uprooted. Mm. Mm. And I think as we're talking about Ugh. this, as we're talking about how we as parents, which I'm well equipped at this point, I feel like to, to talk about at least the first seven years of parenthood. Um, these people are, they have this mindset. And so obviously to me, the best answer is homeschooling. The best answer is to remove this sort of influence, uh, this sort of grooming, this sort of ideological indoctrination from your children in any way that you can. I yeah. think that the best possible way is homeschooling. Like you said, that's not for everyone. Not everyone can do it. Not everyone can pull it off. But it seems to me that where you are not nurturing your children, Someone they will is. find a way to do so. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know. Like you, you guys haven't had little boys and little girls running around your house. But let me tell you, the gender um, differentiation is so natural it is for for i maybe i'm lucky but all of my kids all of my boys are friggin boys all of my girls are girls and so i feel that as a parent my job is to affirm them where they are so 
if I'm not affirming them in their identity and letting them know that, yes, my oldest son is a little bit sweeter to the girls, that, yes, nurturing a child is a manly trait because mm -hmm. you've seen me model it in your life, and that is not a bad thing. That is not a feminine thing, and femininity isn't bad. It's good and beautiful in its own way. But I don't know if you saw me. I just literally caught a fruit fly in my fingers and flicked it off wow. the side of the screen. That's Jedi Ninja. as fuck, dude. Yeah. Oop. <laughs> but we said we job, were going to swear. <laughs> your child to. is the most important outside of your spouse. I feel like that is important to say. Outside of your spouse, your child, your children are the most important people in your life. They are the people Absolutely. that you are giving and imparting identity to. And if you aren't modeling it, if you aren't affirming them in who they are and how that connects to them themselves as a man, as a woman, mm -hmm. you are going to find these nefarious people with their own malicious plans. They're giving them an open door to come in. So as a father, and this is this is gendered as hell. My job is to protect <laughs> my children. My my wife's job in a lot of ways is to nurture them. We both do both. However, you know there is the gender the the gender um, differentiation of mama bear versus papa bear, which yeah. is mama bear is willing to fight over anything. Like Mama Bear goes into action immediately. Papa Bear assesses the risk, risk, and then destroys. And so, mm. as as a man, as a woman, if you're not, I think maybe, and hear me out here, because I'm thinking this on the fly. Your job I'm as listening. a parent is to be secure in yourself. If you are not secure in yourself and in your identity, there's no possible way that you can impart secure identity and attachment in your own children. It's not possible. Holla. Holla. It's not That's possible. Amazing. Yeah. I am in charge of me, and from there flows my charge of my children. Mm -hmm. And I love them. And if it's not something I would want to deal with, if it's not something that I want to put myself into if i don't want to have to fight battles i need to know where my strengths are and i need to be able to fight and not only fight but model that fight for those children and so the right. most important thing is your children in a big way but if you were incapable of your identity of your security and of your ability to share who you are kids will never will never be it's impossible it's impossible to impart into someone else something you do not have. Yeah. So I'm just going to say right here, if you are not secure in your identity, I'm going to curse. Get fucking secure. Because you cannot share what you do not have. Hmm. An empty bucket cannot fill other empty buckets. I, you know, I, I've, I've been thinking about that. Um, um. I don't know if it's in the Bible or not, but I think that it is. Um, that Probably. charity charity begins at home. It's not in the Bible, like, but you know, it's, it's not in the Bible. Okay, yeah. I thought that's where it came from. But like, I, I've been thinking about what that really means, and I think that it's deeper than simply that giving to like a, a soup kitchen or a Goodwill, like getting the old clothes out of your closet. I think it's deeper than that. I well, think charity that, um, is another word for love. Like if you, you know. it has to begin with yourself. Like you have to be charitable mm -hmm. to yourself first. And then when you're charitable to yourself and you give to yourself and you make yourself secure and safe, then you can go about the business of making other people feel secure and safe, making um, charitable actions to the outside world. And yeah. um, I'm preaching I think to you myself here. On. I'm preaching to myself here. In order for me to teach my children to make their bed, I have to show them how to make a bed. And if I'm not making oh, my bed, up. I don't know how to do it. So I don't know oh, if that right. meant anything to you, but there you go. There's it my just, there's my two cents. 
just to clarify, Cam's got all the kids. I don't actually have children. Oh, um, I'm, I apologize. No, I thought you had that, said that you did have children for some reason. I, 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 when I was asking the question about parents, I did say we. So it's like completely understandable why you thought that. And also I'm of the age group where most of us have children at this point. I just don't happen to have them. But I kind of said like, what do parents do? And I used we. Um, so, but Cam's got enough for the both of us. So <laughs> I would be happy to send you We're covered. 2.5 of my children. I think we've a covered different ones on a different given day. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, got it. So I just want to say like any of the things that I might give as advice toward parents, I'm more asking than I, I have no advice for parents. I'm not one. So take and what I, will, I say with a grain of salt. And I will tell you everything that I just said was me thinking in the moment. And I think it's true. Freestyle, baby. But, you know, I am still learning. I will keep learning until the day that I die. And any wisdom that I impart, any wis any things that I say that are true, oftentimes are in spite of myself. <sighs> because I don't always model it. I don't yeah. always do that. Like there are things, like the most frustrating thing I think as a parent that I have ever seen is the behavior that I hate in myself being modeled by my children. Mm. Mm. They mm -hmm. are sponges. Every they're single like mirrors. Thing. Yeah, they're well, and that's okay. So, I'll put it in the most sociological context that I can. But I think that you know, as I grew as a person, as a man, there have been different stages in my life. I think age birth to twenty five, that is typically a very me stage. That's when you're finding who you are, and I remember being told before I was 25 that brain development continues until 25. And so I remember when I was like 22, 23 going, I have three years to make sure I don't keep this crap in my life that I don't want. Mm -hmm. And I tried and I failed in some areas, um, <laughs> but you know, one to 25. And then I think that there are these beautiful um, institutions that help you mature. And so once I got married, it couldn't be about me anymore. Mm. It couldn't because I have another person that I love, that I want to care for, that I want to provide for, that I want, that I would kill and die for. And so outside of the me, it became a we. Mm. And marriage is beautiful and having a partner is wonderful, but it's not it's only a mirror so far. Mm -hmm. It only goes so far. You can only see yourself in their reactions to you. And you can mm. only know what you hate in yourself and what you dislike in yourself in so far as they will communicate it with you. But there's I... no mirror like children. There's no you know... revealing nature to anyone else in your life than when you see your <laughs> your four-year-old son call your seven-year-old son a bastard and you go, shit, <laughs> that's you know, me. <laughs> as soon as we end this, I'm going to call my dad and be like, hey, dad, what are the qualities in me that you see that make you go, oh, man? Like, I'm just <laughs> so curious to know that. And, and I will say, like, I'm not saying I'm special or perfect, but I do think that a lot of people are less self-examining uh, than I am. Mm. I don't give myself quarter. I don't let myself off the hook at all. Give yourself some dime, man. If you can't Dude, give yourself quarter, give yourself some dime. <laughs> <laughs> but all I'm saying and this has been a monologue, and I'm sorry. Hopefully, it was somewhat good. But the best <laughs> thing you can be for your children is to be secure in yourself, is to know who you are, to share who you are, and to be consistent in who you are. Because children are looking for identity their whole lives. They're looking for who they are. And nine out of ten times, I love a mom. Moms are good, but I found my, my identity in my dad. 
My daughters will find their identity more so in their mothers, but in their mother. I only have one wife. Okay. Just, just so you know, <laughs> no um, polygamy, no polygamy, <laughs> even though we're going to have a guy on the show later on who was born in a polygamous compound. So that's, that's going to be so wild. interesting. I'm so, I was really into that show, <laughs> big love. So I'm super <laughs> interested to talk to this guy. I'm sorry but that. <laughs> children need models. And so if you are not modeling, you are not parenting. And if you are not totally. conscientiously and consistently modeling, you're, I'm not going to say you're failing, but you're falling short. And mm -hmm. if you know it, and if you have the self-examination to do so, you can change it. Children. Wise words. Children need to be loved, but almost even more so they need to be affirmed and they need to be grounded. And I don't mean like, hey, stay in your room. I mean, they need to know who they are and that who they are is beautiful. They need and to know. Right. They need to know that, I, I, you know, I have my particular um, views on um, morality in all sorts of ways. But they need to know that... <laughs> They need to know that it's okay to need other people and that in order to need other people, you have to vet other people mm. and you do have to judge. And I don't mean to be judgmental, but you need to be able you to tell to. if someone is a good person before connecting that person to you in any meaningful way. This is kind of why I like the word discernment over yeah. the word judgment yeah. because yeah. Like judgment, like God has final judgment, not to, I mean, I don't know what your particular faith background is, but for, for me, God has the final judgment. Whereas we as human beings, we're not supposed to judge, but we are meant to discern and we were given a logical mind in order that we do discern. And so that, um, I think we do conflate a lot of times with the idea of judgment um, and, and chastise ourselves for doing it. And we shouldn't always we should have discernment. We should have judgment. Yeah. We were given that so that we don't reach our hands into dark holes and have them bitten by snakes. Like that's mm. part of our evolutionary makeup is that we like discern and not have this blind trust for everybody who says that they're out for our benefit. Cause they, they're not, you know, like yeah. a lot of Sorry, times the people, a lot of times the people that are the loudest about how great they are and how great their ideas are, are, you know, the most dangerous. People and they are they are the most dangerous people for your children as well because um, that can be very manipulative. Yeah. Well, and, and, and nine out of ten times, the people who are outwardly and openly trying to convince you that they are right are not convinced themselves that they are. Hmm. And that is a self-convincing period. Mm -hmm. It's self-persuasion. Um, but no, there's something there's something beautiful about the fact that we get the opportunity to create tiny versions of ourselves. <laughs> the bad you know, thing is that they often come with the bad stuff too. There's a great um, Tom Segura bit about this. I think it's in ball hog where he talks about um, having children and like loving them is the most narcissistic thing because they are little tiny versions of you. And you're like, I just love me. You're just such a little <laughs> me and I just love you. And I mean, the evolution set that up that way so that we wouldn't like leave them in the woods when they're being awful. But Absolutely. it is, it's like, oh, I love me and you're a little me. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say that the word judgment or judging is a word that like love in the English language is imprecise. Mm. And it could we could use different words. Discernment may be a very good word for it because it's like I've had people say that are my friends, don't judge me. And I'm like, well, I've already judged you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be my friend because mm. I have judged you to be worthy of my mm -hmm. friendship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's or or people will say don't judge a book by its cover, but covers are how you know what a book is about. And I'm not yeah. trying to read a book about like wood joining if I want well, to read a book about like romance, you know, like, of course was, you judge a book by its cover. That's the only way was, to do it. There was a book the other day that I commented about on Twitter that I got a lot of flack for. And it was because 
the subtitle of the book told me everything I needed to know about the perspective of the author and the lack of objectivity that was going to be in that book. Mm. And so, yeah, no, don't judge a person based purely off of how they look. Cause I mean, would you be able to tell that I'm a Christian with five children based on my tattooed arm? Probably not, but you can judge people off of their words and a, a book cover like a person is going to tell you who they are. And when they tell you who they are, you should believe them. Mm-hmm. I know that's right. <laughs> so, I am, right. I'm so ready. Like after all of this for the hope question, like, Oh, oh boy, it's I coming. Need, I need it so bad. <laughs> like, okay. So <laughs> let's get to it. Um, after every episode, which I doubt everyone makes it through all two hours of each episode. Um, but, you know, I have the rule that came from, um, I'm not, I don't listen to a lot of Joe Rogan, but one of the things that he said was that if you are having fun, then your audience will have fun with you. Mm. And so when I, when we do an episode, our episodes are anywhere from 90 minutes to question mark. And it's always dependent on whether or not, and you know, if you had a shorter episode and you came on our show, I'm sorry. I'm not saying this is necessarily you. Don't tell them. But <laughs> if a conversation is worth having, we're going to have it until it's finished. So two and a half hours, you showed up, Kat. Good conversation. You showed up. And I'm, I've, I've been thrilled about it the whole time. I found you on TikTok to be very interesting and engaging. And you have a story that is worth telling. And not only is it worth telling, it is something that could affect others in a very positive way. And that's why I wanted to have you on the show. So I'm not much of anything. But let me tell you, I am proud of what you're doing. And I think what you're doing is worthwhile. So at the end of every episode, we ask, we ask people the question previously. And so we talked about the red pill in a sense that awake political awakening Mm -hmm. within that paradigm is the concept of the white pill, which the white pill is essentially hope. It's Mm. being able to see not only that what we are doing is worthwhile, but we can win in some sense of the word. Typically, we would ask it as, what's your white pill for the week? But we've reframed it because I think that in a lot of ways, these are terms that aren't fantastic for everyone. So (laughs) let me ask you, what is something right now in your life? It could be locally, globally, what I say? I already said locally, nationally, whatever. What gives you hope to carry on? what motivates you to do what you're doing and what is something that you could impart to our listeners who make it to the two hour and 40 minute mark that'll make them know that the fight is worth fighting. Mm. Well, a couple of, um, a couple of interrelated things. So one thing that you were talking about, um, Cam more in the context of family, um, how you were kind of stepping outside of yourself and, you know, becoming a we instead of a me, like, like a way that could be interpreted is, um, um, and some of some else of what you were saying too, but we always have the choice to self reflect and we can, we can, we can only, we need to learn to control um, or work on controlling ourselves and also having compassion for ourselves Um, And then once we have that, we've done that inner work, then we can kind of branch out to other people. And so, you know, I, that's the thing. Um, Sometimes it can feel disparaging that the only person we can control is ourself. But actually, I think that's very empowering. Because I think if we all can self reflect, and, um, you know, for me, meditation is, you know, is meditation is my major form of self-reflection, um, as well as creative stuff, um, gratitude, journaling, and, you know, all these tools that I can do on my own. Um, and also con- trying to connect with nature at least once a day is very important for me too, because it just helps you to see that, you know, 
like humans aren't the only ones on the planet either. Like there are all these like beautiful other beings on the planet and there's just so much like wide open space. Um, and not to sound cheesy or anything, but I, I have to get outside like once a day and it just kind of takes me outside of myself. And uh, like in my TikToks, I'm always walking in the woods because I literally walk in the woods like every day. Yeah. Um, and, you know, even if you don't live near the woods, just trying to incorporate nature into your life in a way that you can. Maybe it's planting something. Um, but, yeah, so I think the self-reflection is really possible. And what gives me hope is that... Um, the more we can understand ourselves, the more we will understand others. And, you know, I think once that gets more momentum, which starts with us, right? I think that things in the world will naturally start resolving themselves and they will, will start, the path will become clear once we start walking that path. Yeah. Um, As Gandhi and, said, be the change you want to see in the world. Yes, exactly. Thank you for, I, I, um, I knew there were pro I was probably stepping on like a bunch of great quotes I could have um, cited. So thank you. Yeah. Be the change you want to see. And that honestly, that's so empowering. And, you know, we have more control. We have more control over what's going on in the world than we think um, mm -hmm. because we have control over our reaction. Um, and, you know, I, I get a, I do get a lot of negative reactions on TikTok, but every once in a while I do talk to a person who says, you know, you actually changed my mind or, you know, they go from attacking me to having a, like a um, civil conversation. Um, even if we don't end up agreeing at the end, it's like, you know, we understand each other more. So mm -hmm. I just think as we work on ourselves, it, it will slowly, little by little, create change in the world. Yeah, I, I it makes me think of um, a couple of quotes, actually. Um, cool. Uh, there's a band called Me Without You. I couldn't tell you the name of the song, but um, I love this little line that they have in the song, which is a, gl a glass can only spill what it contains. Mm -hmm. um, and then the follow up is it is alleged it's not really but people always uh, associate with frank saint francis of assisi but it's um and it, i i would say you can secularize this in a sense within our conversation but um it's he said go out into the world and preach the gospel when necessary use words mm. and so our example i agree with you is infinitely important because even it may only affect you it may only affect your family it may only affect your community but there's a chance that it goes further and right. there is the concept of the butterfly effect and so putting out beauty and good and truth into the world um just just like you know you know who i am at this point um but just like the the word of god doesn't return void i think that good actions and doing good things does not return void i think mm -hmm. that there's you when what you sow you reap and you can be the catalyst for someone sowing a better life and right. sowing a better future and if you're the if you're capable of doing that you should do that you should be the change that you want to see in the world but i'll get off my soapbox now um so <laughs> Kat, I've enjoyed talking to you. Like I said, I've enjoyed very much your TikToks for a while now. Um, I think that you are filling a niche that a lot of people don't know exist. You are highlighting and putting a spot a spotlight on something that your enemies, as it were, don't want to be seen. So I appreciate you. Thank you so much for coming on our show. And Thank you for having time me. You're welcome. And, and, and I, 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 I like a show like there are some shows that are just fun and just friends talking. But when I walk away with a better understanding of a subject that I didn't have before, mm -hmm. I'm far more thrilled with those episodes. And you've you've provided that. So I appreciate I, it. I will say that um, I didn't get into it um, too much during the live feed. And um, I'll hopefully be able to explain to you why after we wrap up. 
but um, this has been uh, very pivotal and personal to me. And so I appreciate that you've taken the time to talk to us because like Cam, it's not something I had like a um, fully realized understanding of. I don't even now, but it is something that is touching a lot of people who don't have the education or um, they are equipped with the experience to um, even know where to begin handling it. So I just think that, you know, the, the work that you're doing is incredibly important for people um, that you may never hear from, will never uh, communicate with you, but you're really, really helping people. And, you know, I personally appreciate you. Thank you so, so much. Oh, thank you, Jessica. <laughs> and thank you, Cam. It's been wonderful talking to each of you. Um, you both made some really good points and I, I enjoyed listening just as much as I enjoyed talking. So um, yeah, I think uh, you two are doing wonderful work as well. Thank you. Well, what I'll do now is since I didn't say this before we got on here is I will pull you from the feed in a second and okay. tell everyone what's coming up in the future. But before that, I want to make sure people can find you. So you can add to this list. It's not, it not, it's not necessarily exhaustive. But I think that I found Kat on TikTok. So if you want to see what she's doing and see the things that she's saying and the different points she's making on TikTok, she's at Kat underscore Katinson. Um, she's also on Twitter. I don't know how much she's on there. That's my main way to, um, you know, shit post. So that's where I just I am. started. <laughs> I just started <laughs> posting uh, more on Twitter, actually. Um so I, I've been posting pretty much daily on there, um, just like a couple tweets. Um, so I'm still learning that platform. But um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, TikTok is like my most, well, I'm actually taking a little break, just a few days off of TikTok right now. Um, but I will be back doing that daily. Um, YouTube I'm, that is probably my second, Twitter and YouTube are probably my second most active uh, platforms. And I'm on Instagram as well. Right, so I will. I have your Twitter, which is at Cat Catinson, and your Instagram, which is at Cat Catinson underscore. Mm -hmm. I don't have your YouTube though because I found you on Twitter. So I, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm insufficient in this moment. You, you've shown my lacking. <laughs> so I will. I'll put that. I'll update that for the description once we get off of here. But if you could share what what to search for to find you on YouTube. Yeah. Um. It might. I think it might come up. Um, if you just type Kat Catinson in the search bar, but just to make sure you might want to type Kat Catinson detransition because that will definitely bring it up. Um. <laughs> you you come right up when I type it, type in Kat Catinson. Okay, cool, cool. Yep. That's, awesome. that's awesome. I didn't know if I'd gotten to that point of YouTube uh, subscribers yet where I would actually come up in the search because for a long time it was like hard to find me on YouTube because I didn't, um, I just, I recently had a video that did really, really well. And I went from having like a few hundred followers to like over 2000. So, um, yeah, and you have 30,000 on TikTok. <laughs> so, I mean, like, dang, kicking, kicking butt over there. Um, but <laughs> with that, um, again, I thank you and I will pull you off the screen, but you can hang out. Cause I think Jessica does want to mention something to you afterwards. I just have a quick question for you afterwards. I won't keep you forever. I promise. I have church oh, yeah. in the morning anyway. So, okay. All right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank like, again, thank you so much. And we'll talk to you in just a second. All right. So for the rest of you, we have all sorts of fun things coming up. Um, so let's start with what's coming up in the future next week. Jessica's out for the week. And so me and Monica Perez from the Pro Propaganda Report will be chatting. I'll figure out something to talk about by then. She's a wonderful person. It should be fun. Um, beyond that, we have our, um, what's it called? St. Patrick's Day episode, which is with an, <laughs> I an Irish woman who's also a soil scientist. So that should be yes. fairly interesting. And I will not so drink a, too much. A dirty Irish yeah, a, a, a dirty, dirty Irish woman. A dirty, we um, have a dirty Irish. <laughs> uh, beyond that, we have Brit, uh, our friend Brit, coming on. Salt, salty Sal Brit, salty the queen Brit, of salt, the queen of salt, the patron <laughs> saint of salt, Brit. Yeah. And as with every month, at the end of the month, now we are now having Brad Binkley from the Propaganda Report to come on the show to talk about things that we've learned during the month, as well as just to find out what we missed in the way of 
the corporate media and what they're trying to sell us. I don't watch the news on purpose. I don't either. Because the they only, lie. The only time I watch the news is when I have to be on the propaganda report. <laughs> but beyond that, uh, let's see. Uh, if you want to see these episodes early, like Quest was able to this week. Again, thank you, Quest, for that bottle of Redbreast 12-year. Oh, my gosh. You've made my month. Thank you. Uh, Patreon.com slash the mad ones. We have Zoom calls. We have other things that if you want to connect with us more, I don't know why you'd want to, but hey, you might want to. Um, like I said, we are the mad ones. Doc, no, patreon.com slash the mad ones. If you'd like to rep us, if you'd like to show off, if you'd like a nice mug with me and Jessica as Avengers characters, you can go to we are the mad ones.com slash store, pick up a mug, a shirt or a tank top because tank tops are the best type of shirt that you can own. And if you don't own them, I question your humanity. Um, beyond that, uh, I'm on Twitter at ham Carlos because I said mean things about Justin Trudeau and Jessica is at soup canarchist for now. It may for change. Now. We never know. We'll see. Um, beyond that, like I, like I've said every week, um, we do have a Bible study that we've been doing. So if you are interested in looking at the book of Acts and talking about uh, God, Christianity, whatever, you can join us with that. Just send me a message on Twitter. My DMs are open, and we'll get you sorted out there. If you'd like to listen, we're themadamones.com or your favorite podcatcher. We're on all of them. If you notice that we're not on one of them, let me know, because I've been very vigorous about making sure you can get to us. Um past that uh if you are listening you can watch us every week on wednesday at 8 30 p.m eastern time we are live on youtube youtube.com slash the mad ones we're we're live on rockfin and we're live on odyssey uh beyond that i don't think i have anything to tell people what you, you got anything you got any final words of hobbit wisdom for the people <laughs> no, um, not <laughs> Hobbit wisdom in particular, but um, guys, if you are watching us on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button and hit like that bumps us up in the algorithm and we can get further and further up so we can be as awesome and famous as Kat. And when you type our names into YouTube, it will actually come up as our channel. That Instead would be of some dang musical. <laughs> right, right. And so um... <laughs> and share us with your friends. And share us with your friends because they're gonna love us too. I mean, we are just the best talkers. We've got <laughs> chemistry for days. I give the best introductions to guests you've ever heard. It's true, it's true. So with that, I will I will leave you with my typical nonsense, which is you, which is not nonsense. I think it's true. No, it's not. Um, it's true. You have a chance to be in a light in the world. So go light it up. <laughs>